girder. A secret moment in the very beginning of this strange dinosaur's life. The dinosaurs had not died, perhaps in some catastrophe. No reason to think dinosaurs wouldn't still be here, wouldn't still be dominating. Tradune. Dirt. 
dirt or dirt.
that I can't quite tell you about, about yet, but I'm very excited to be able to do so when I get the go-ahead on that. Anyway, I'm glad you're here, everyone. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. If anybody's here for the very first time, let me introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Hopefully, you're already aware that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. That's me, but I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, as you could probably guess. I'm looking at my office here. But uh, here on Twitch, I talk about paleontology. This is my means of doing science outreach. Uh, five days a week, well, usually five days a week, I'm here on stream discussing my own research and that of my colleagues, going over new publications in fossil science, talking about what's going on in uh, the study of natural history and why it's important, why it's relevant to your everyday life. This is what I'm passionate about and I'm really glad to be able to, to share it with you. Now, uh, that's obviously in the non-field season when it's not summertime. When it is summertime, I'm out in the field digging up dinosaurs like I was for just about two months this summer. The entire month of June and then much of July and August too. I was in Wyoming and then Utah digging up at least three new species of dinosaur this year. Very excited about that. So, uh, yeah. With that being said, if you happen to have any questions at all about dinosaurs in particular, because dinosaurs are that specific aspect of paleontology where I hold my expertise to the extent that that exists. <laughs> um, Dinosaurs are what I actually work on, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and what I dig up. But if you've got questions about broader topics, about natural history in general, about extinction or evolution or the fossil record or the very philosophy of science itself, I'll do my very best to answer those questions for you. So I'm glad you're here. Don't be shy with those questions. On today's broadcast, we're going to be looking at some fossil news, and I'm also going to be assembling a life-size 3D printed skull that just uh, came hot off the printer. Skull of Dippy, the famous Diplodocus specimen. Uh, the holotype of Diplodocus carnegii. Holy cow! Uh, what was that? Uh, I guess that was a highlight my message thing? I've got a new lighting set up in here, too. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll show off that a little bit as well. Anywho, yeah, but, uh, anyway, good stuff. Dat Truth has got a question. Just wondering, why are most dinosaur bones in museums made of rat bones and resin casts? I don't know where in the world you got that, but that's rat bones? What? There's not a, I, I can't think of a single dinosaur skeletal mount anywhere in the world that's made of rat bones. Why don't they just use the actual bones they dig up instead of showing us fakes? Ask Dat Truth. I'm glad you asked that question. Here in my office, I don't have a lot of real fossils. These are mostly 3D prints. Because as we always talk about here on this channel, you know, if something is an actual scientifically important vertebrate fossil, then where does that belong? It's difficult to put the actual bones on display sometimes, though. Here's the thing. I'll show you. When we're talking about... Here. I'll show you an example. It's kind of a classic one. I've shown this many times before, but it gets the point across. This is a resin cast of the Wonkel Rex Tyrannosaurus specimen. Used to be Museum of the Rocky Specimen 555, uh, but then the original was sent to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And, uh... Hi. Are you here. The Tank Theory. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, here is the actual skeleton at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Showing you a better picture. There we go. Yeah. So with some of these, we just don't have enough specimens for them to be in multiple museums throughout the world. 
And so in this case, this is the actual skeleton right here, but there are copies of this one that you can see in Berkeley, California, and Mountain View, California, in Bozeman, Montana, in uh, Boston, I think, has one. Um, there's a whole bunch of different institutions around the world. There's one in Japan that's got a cast of this. But there's only one original, and you can see that one on display at the Smithsonian. The thing is, the actual fossil bones are much more delicate and usually heavier than the resin casts. And you can't just do quick and simple tricks like drilling holes straight through them in order to get them to stand upright. You've got to create this complicated system of, of you know, metal armature that holds it upright in order to be able to have it on display. I'll show you a clip of that. Um, here we go. I think this is the right one. Here we go. Yeah. So that metal armature that you're seeing there is really expensive to make. And so it's often much cheaper to just make a replica of the skeleton and put it on display. But a lot of people want to see the real thing, and that's important. So that's what they're doing here. Our artists like love having art background. We have conservators, preparators. How expensive are the resin cats? They're more expensive than they used to be, but... Uh, Huge feather in our cap, yeah. you know, like, but, you know, and, you know, especially after like, they're not priceless like the yeah, actual fossils are. You know, museums throughout the world. This is gonna come down. Yeah. Uh, hot girl, Maiko. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Like this, more in a straight line. So there's a uh, curator of dinosaurs, Matt Carano. I spent some time with him last summer at the. Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems meeting in Utah. Release the tension on cool the tail and make it go more like this, more in a straight line. It's incredibly complicated and requires a number of different disciplines and expertise to put together a, an exhibit. And we work on it for years, um, assembling all of these different elements. And when you walk in the hall, all of that is invisible to you as a visitor. In this particular project, the biggest challenge probably has been the interaction of the two animals. A T-Rex standing over a triceratops. It, it so this is such a right massive undertaking. It's kind of crazy when you think about plus it. All of the other elements and make it work was challenging in the fact that it's just so much going on. The armature that holds the uh, real fossil, which we call yep. the fossil holder. There we has, go. Some people call them antlers, fingers, whatever you want to call them. But it usually consists of a piece of half round with pieces that are tapered and they follow the contour of the bone very closely. And so that's the thing, is that when you've got actual fossil bone, you've got to find a way to securely hold it in place so it won't fall apart, but it's got to be gentle enough that you're not cracking the bone or anything like that, too. And that's really difficult. So that's why they've got so many welders on staff here, so many metal workers. If you've got a resin cast, it doesn't matter. You could just jam a metal rod straight through it. It doesn't matter, you know? Does that make sense? It's got a high percentage of real fossil, but where you see the white areas, yep. uh, those are generally cast materials that have been su supplemented in. The ribs, there's white, and then of course all the cracks. This skull will be a uh, cast. The skull is the one part. Oh, you don't want the real skull up there, shoot. Scientific interest. And so we want to make that accessible to scientific study. And if we position it like this, it's really going to make it impossible for a scientist to get at it. Yep. Um, also and so I think, I haven't been there yet, but I'm pretty sure that they've got the actual skull in a glass case right next to that main display. So it's, it's there in the main hall. You can still go and see it, but if scientists need to get at it in order to be able to study it, if a paleontologist like me wants to go in there and take some measurements or, you know, look at the space in between the teeth or something like that, we can easily do that. We couldn't do it if it's, you know, suspended, biting the skull of this triceratops right there. It just makes it so much more difficult. And that way you kind of get a two for one, too. You get a, a cool display with a cast of the skull doing something dynamic, and then you can go see the real skull just steps away right there in the same hall. So the precariousness of the way this mount yeah. is, with the skull really hanging off the neck as it is in a live animal, is not well suited to mounting a real bone. Yeah, that's true, too. 
It's the same with uh, with Sue in uh, the Field Museum. Yeah. So even though this is Sue's actual skeleton on display there in the Field Museum, that's a replica of her skull. The real one is in a glass cabinet. I think basically facing her. It's like just out of frame right here. And the real skull is distorted. It was crushed during diagenesis. So, you know, with all of these multiple tons of rock that were deposited over her after she was buried, the skull got kind of smushed. So there's the cast skull right there that they've kind of artificially unsmushed. But her actual skull looks like this. The actual fossil bone is right there on display in the same hall. Yeah, and I believe that's Jingmei O'Connor right there next to her. Yeah. Anyway, that makes sense? So, uh, was it that truth? I hope that answers your question. Welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. Yeah. I'm still wondering where the rat bones thing came from, though. Some sort, some sort of, like, TikTok conspiracy theory or something? Ugh, don't believe everything you hear on TikTok. Seriously, do not believe everything you hear on TikTok. Don't be that gullible, please. Um, I'm glad you're here. You know, talk about this stuff on real terms. And uh, show you the actual stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Oh, and Debt Truth says, How come the Bible, the Word of God, goes against the whole dinosaur history? It doesn't. What are you talking about? From, so that's not so you should maybe you know, it's easy for me to say talk to a biblical scholar about this like somebody who actually studies the bible if you know if you're into that they'll tell you that's not like a literal story the book of genesis is not a natural history textbook you're completely like misinterpreting and warping that book you're missing the entire point of it you know talk to a biblical scholar about this sometime and they'll tell you like for crying out loud what on on day one it's separating light from darkness um but then there's what source of light could there be because there weren't stars yet you know stuff like that it just it's not meant to make literal sense it's not a literal chronology of events it's almost like poetry you know, like you're you're reading it wrong if you think that it's supposed to be an actual history of how things came to be, you know? And I think that's honestly incredibly disrespectful to treat it like that. Like the book of Genesis is not supposed to be a geology textbook. It's not why it was written, you know? You're missing the point if you're treating it like that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, dinosaurs aren't all real. Trex is fake. Act. Giants. Oh, boy. I hope you're trolling right now. I hope that... Oh, boy. I hope you don't mean this sincerely. But if you do mean this sincerely, I'm glad that you're here. You know? Let's talk about it. Man, there's a lot of stuff that you've been misled about. If you think that human giants are real and dinosaurs aren't. I literally dig up dinosaurs. I was doing that live on stream for two months this summer. And that's why I do this. Because there are people who have been misled, you know? There's a lot of nonsense online, and I'm trying to do my small part to, you know, show people the actual facts. You can see with your own two eyes, you know? And don't just trust me on this. Talk to any other paleontologist. Talk to any other biologist, geologist, zoologist, whatever, you know? I promise we're not part of some giant global conspiracy to fool people, you know? Uh, 
as we were, then... <laughs> Man, I would hope I'd get be getting paid a lot better than I am right now, because currently this is how I make my living, is streaming here on Twitch. It's a meager living, but it's what I enjoy doing, and I'm very lucky. But man... Sometimes I wish there was some sort of global conspiracy or something like that, because, you know... <laughs> be getting paid a lot better, you know? I'm just kidding. I wouldn't be able to... I wouldn't be happy doing that. Not a big fan of lying, you know? Anywho. Yeah. Uh, it's a brand new ID, Danny? What are you talking about? Oh, the person who... Uh... Yeah, maybe they're just trolling. And Terry Taylor, thank you. I did get a haircut. Yeah, just this morning. Thank you for noticing. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anywho. Uh, Claire says, you would be rich if this was fake. I know, right? Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And... Scrolling, scrolling... And Gay Hibiscus says, I know people enjoy their herbivorous and carnivorous dinosaurs, but are there some dinosaurs that many people would know were omnivores? Or ovivores? Or insectivores? One of the dinosaurs that I helped bring to light is thought to have been an insectivore. Here, let me, let me show you. And then there are a number of different dinosaurs that we think were probably omnivorous too, but it's difficult to tell. There are a lot of dinosaurs that we're very sure were meat eaters and a lot that were very sure were plant eaters and there are some a lot of them toothless a lot of toothless dinosaurs we suspect may have been omnivorous maybe eating plants and or meat plants and meat um oh goodness afro bandit girl thank you very much for the tier two sub now at 21 months holy cow already wow Thank you, thank you, Afro Bandit Girl. I appreciate you. Holy cow. Yeah. Um. Thank you for your continued support. I really appreciate it. Uh. Yeah, I don't know. If a dinosaur was kind of in between eating plants and meat, it's a difficult thing to demonstrate, you know? But there are a number of different dinosaurs. The Ornithomimosaurs are a good example. Some of the Therizinosaurs. Um. Yeah, critters like that. Ornithomimids are a great example. These very ostrich-like dinosaurs. That's usually the kind of popular nickname for the group is the ostrich dinosaurs. Uh, like this guy here. And they've got these toothless beaks. They very well may have been omnivorous. Eating plants and meat. We don't really know. They probably ate kind of whatever they could get their beaks around. And then, um... Dinosaurs like Falcarius right here very well may have been omnivorous as well. Uh, their ancestors seemed to have been meat-eaters. At least that's... That story might be changing, actually, with upcoming research. I have rumors about this. Anyway. Oh, there's, uh... There's Jim Kirkland with Falcarius right there. Oh, that's such a tiny picture. Anyway, these guys seem to be kind of transitioning from carnivory to herbivory, so they may have been kind of in an in-between state. And, uh, they may have been omnivores, too. Yeah. And Dr. Terminator, I think you're talking about Limiosaurus, right? Yeah, these guys may have actually changed their diet during ontogeny. Um, so yeah, they may have gone from being mostly carnivorous when they were really young to being mostly herbivorous when they're larger and older. We're still trying to figure this out. These guys are really cool and interesting. But yeah, Limiosaurus. It's a Noasaurid, so like this weird kind of derived Ceratosaur. They are, uh, they're interesting critters. Um, yeah, here's a depiction of that with, uh, some juveniles that are like, eating a little lizardy guy. Anyway, 
Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, oh, and goodness, Tiny Toxic Tofu. Thank you, thank you. For the four months of support, I really appreciate that. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you, Tiny Toxic Tofu. How have you been doing? How's laboratory work been? How's academia treating you? Well, I hope. Thank you for your ongoing support. I if really you're appreciate it. you a bit it. cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Hogan698, for the 100 bits. Thank you kindly. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and Casey Snowart says, wait, is the lights flickering connected to your subs? Yeah, Apparently. You could hire a dinosaur to put a swimming pool in your backyard. All you'd have to do is show up for five minutes, whop, instant swimming pool. Michael F., thank you for the 13 months. I appreciate that, Prime. Thank you, thank you for that. I want to see if I can find a way to turn that off because that's not why I I got the smart lights and I find it a little annoying. But we'll see. Yeah. Anywho, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's a feature I would like to turn off, Anakin Gabriel, yeah. We'll see. Uh, yeah, Casey Snower, I was working on that this weekend, setting up the lights and... Uh, doing all these tests and everything, but I wasn't live, so I didn't know that that happens when you get a resubscription or something. So I don't know. I'm gonna see if I can find a way to turn that off. But yeah. Anywho. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit. Um... So I think we had a long message from somebody. Where was that? Um, where did that go? Oh, and thank you, GeoGym, for the 32 months. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. Ontogeny. Thank you, thank you, GeoGym, for the 27 months. It's a long time. I really appreciate it. Uh, and... Did that message get deleted or something? I thought our... person cosplaying as a creationist had like a long message did it did it get deleted so i was gonna see if i could reply to that um scrolling scrolling yeah oh solvo trode has a good question in the meantime uh, considering that pterosaurs weren't dinosaurs, were there dinosaurs that could fly before birds evolved? Great question, Solvotrode. We don't know yet. We're still trying to figure that out. The whole kind of like the 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 nitty gritty specifics of birds evolving from dinosaurs is still a little bit hazy. We're still kind of figuring some of this stuff out. You know, the maybe the most common answer that you'll hear is that like. You know, once dinosaurs become volant, once that particular branch of dinosaurs that leads to birds is able to fly, then that's when they become birds. That's when the the AV's clade begins, basically. Like that's, you know, the, the distinction that we draw between just very bird-like dinosaurs and actual legit birds. But that old assumption is kind of being called into question with more fossils. It turns out the, the picture might be a little bit more complicated than that, even. Which is exciting stuff. We could talk more about that in a little bit, if you'd like. The Utah Raptor Megablock, which I was streaming uh, back in uh, the end of May, that might hold some really interesting data that might help illuminate things, but also complicate them at the same time. You know? A lot of stuff in science is like that. The more information we have, the more we learn... The more mysteries get solved, but the more mysteries emerge from that, too. There are new questions that we have. For every for every groundbreaking discovery that's made, there are a bunch of new mysteries that come out of that. That's why paleontology never gets old, I guess. Uh, pun intended. Yeah. We are in the golden age of fossil science right now. It's like Jim Kirkland says, these are the good old days. 
the pace of dinosaur discovery is at an all-time high. It's a good time to be a paleontologist. My, uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. And holy cow, Murph. 26 months. That is almost a whole year, isn't it? Appreciate you, Murph. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support. It means a great deal to me. Um, thank you kindly, Murph. Holy cow. Yeah. Excuse me. Um. Yeah. I can undo it if you want, says Clever. Yeah, go ahead and undo that. You know, I... I'm not averse to the idea of, you know, as long as somebody espousing creationist beliefs isn't going to be outright bigoted, as long as they're not going to be saying slurs or actively, like, you know, making people feel uncomfortable. I am 100% here to have conversations with people, even people who've got very different perspectives than mine. Because that's the thing, I'm... I try to think of these streams as an act of, of public service. You know? I'm a public servant here. There are all of these amazing discoveries that fossil scientists have made. But we don't always do a great job of communicating those findings to the public. And heaven knows that the U.S. public school system let alone private schools, uh, have a tendency toward not teaching proper science, especially with regard to biology, evolution, etc. And I like to think that I'm seem like much. Five hundred bits goes a long way towards helping fight against that a little bit. You know, fighting a good fight. Hey, Danny. Here's Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. I took at the South Australian Museum for you. Oh, very cool. The opalized fossils, the megafauna, and best of all, the fossils of the old... Diacarin, very cool. Very cool, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the 500 bits. I appreciate that. Um, We'll see if we can take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah. And Gay Hibiscus says, if you're a servant, or are you your bosses? In a way, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Rachidactylus. I didn't realize that. Rachidactylus says, I had timed them out because their message included legitimately dangerous anti-vaccine administration alongside the creationist stuff. It's astonishing how often those two things go together, you know? I guess it's not astonishing. It's disturbing how often those two things go together. It's one thing to have misinformed views. It's another to advocate dangerous behavior. Fair. Yeah. That's funny. That's the same reason why, uh... Why I got blocked by Ken Ham. You know, arch creationist on Twitter years ago. This was in, like, March of 2020, I think. It was just when COVID was kicking off. And then, uh... He tweeted some sort of thing about... Uh... Like, oh, everything's in God's hands. You don't have to worry about getting vaccinated. Or something like that. I forget. Or something to do with disease in general. Maybe it was more vague. I don't recall the specifics of what he was posting about. But, I don't know. I was feeling kind of froggy. And I just left a response in the replies. And it was something like... Like, you know... Ken Ham... A lot of people are gonna die... Because of the misinformation that you're spreading. You know, not just the general creationist stuff, but, like, you know, advocating against vaccines and, you know, a lot of people are going to die because of your teachings. And I hope that keeps you up at night. I hope that that weighs you like a millstone around your neck. I hope that weighs on your conscience. And then he blocks me like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it is a badge of honor, Geo Jim. Yes, indeed. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's uploading at the moment. Thank you, uh, Dinosaur Dave. Cool. Terrible lizards, don't you know? And Geeky Heart, thank you for the thousand bits. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. 
Uh, um, oh! And Island J. Mew, thank you, thank you for that question there. Welcome to Paleontologizing. This is actually a piece of news that we're going to be discussing. It's on my roster for today. It's on my agenda to talk about uh, that new study about the Chicxulub asteroid and where it may have come from. Yeah. Uh, where, in your opinion, do you think the asteroid that brought the end of the dinosaurs came from? I, I'm not an astronomer or an astrophysicist or a planetary geologist or anything like that. Um, so the best I could give you is it came from outer space. <laughs> um, but we're going to be looking at that piece of news and talking about that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Stay tuned, because we'll get to it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Thank you, thank you. Victorious. I appreciate that, Victorious. Thank you, thank you. Gift subs in the channel. Good stuff. And Isolated says just got into watching Walking with Dinosaurs for their for the first time. That's a classic from 1999. That's awesome, Isolated. Can't wait for the new one to come out in 2025. Yeah, me too. Ugh. Ugh, I've got... Uh, can I can I vent for a second? Will you, will you let me do that? Um, because I'm a little down on the Walking with Dinosaurs 2025 thing, and it's for personal reasons. Uh, I was supposed to be, well, hoping to be out digging, uh, digging up a bunch of armored dinosaur fossils. Um, Reganation gift thank you, thank you, Reganation. They have uh, for that gift sub. I appreciate that, Reganation. Thank channel. you, thank you. I was supposed to be out there digging in uh, the early fall, both last year and this year, too. And I was really excited to be able to stream from there. Uh, it's an amazing fossil site with just ankylosaur bones spilling out everywhere. Just super abundance of armored dinosaur fossils. From a critter called Gastonia. There we go. Um, that's a pretty good depiction of Gastonia right there. And I was unable to do so. Because the British Broadcasting Corporation apparently had a, a contract where they got exclusive rights to all media at that dig site for two or three years. And so I'm... Uh, I wasn't allowed to broadcast from there. And if I can't broadcast from there, I can't really go dig because I got to pay the bills. And if I'm not streaming, I'm not making any money. So, yeah. Anyway, they can take a hike. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe Walking with Dinosaurs 2020, 2025 will be good. But... I don't know. We'll see. I'm salty about it. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Mm. Sounds very British, says Kino Wolf. Tell me about it. Yeah. Anywho. <laughs> they, they... Yeah. Ah! Anyway, and Salamander says, I'd love to see an ankylosaur dig, just to see if I could pick up on the differences in the bones themselves. They're pretty distinctive, especially the osteoderms. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Beats International says, that's not what I pay my BBC license fee for. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and Lukai says, I mean, it makes sense from BBC's point of view. I don't think it does. I'm not going to... I wasn't going to be in the way. I wasn't going to be leeching off of them. I wasn't going to be harming the production in any way whatsoever. If anything, I would be helping promote it. And now I'm doing precisely the opposite. You know, because they chose to be all, you know, corporate exclusive about it. You know? So, I'm salty. It's not, uh... 
hell. It definitely leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I also heard some things that suggest that uh, scientific accuracy is not at the top of their priority list for this. So we'll see how it turns out, but I don't have high hopes for it. We'll say that. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. You could have an NDA of what the BBC is doing there without blocking all recording. Exactly, Salamander. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we'll see. And Casey Snowart, apparently it's not really going to be walking with dinosaurs. It's going to be something different. Because I don't think Tim Haynes is involved in it in any way. Um. But anyway, we'll see. Um. Yeah. But there you go, Dinosaur Dave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, with that having been said, let me take a minute, and before I forget, let me kind of explain what's going on this week um, here on Paleontologizing. Um, yeah, a little bit of a... I don't know if I can call it an announcement, but let me just try and fill you in with some stuff that's going on right now. There's a, a very good chance that I will not be streaming tomorrow or Wednesday or maybe even Thursday. Oh, hang on a second. I've got some exciting stuff coming up, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But holy cow, Gener Generator Frajdi. What? Generator Frajdi. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's wonderful to have you here. Holy cow. Here, give me just a second here. There we go. Witamy ponownie w paleontologii. Szczerze doceniam napad. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to another edition of Lifestyles of the Large and Extinct. Thank you, Rusty Fingers and Ray Jess, Alternator Hlurk. Uh, Kotenja, I appreciate your follows. Welcome, everybody. Dziękuję bardzo generatorowi za przyciągnięcie tutaj swoich widzów. Proszę, zadaj mi wszelkie pytania dotyczące dinozaurów, jakie możesz mieć. I don't speak Polish, but I appreciate the raid very, very much. Let me know if there's any questions that I can answer for you. My name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. Um, so yeah, as a dinosaur paleontologist, dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and what I dig up during the summers. We just got back from uh, prehistoric time from the field just uh, just a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, last week, or the week before, less than two weeks ago. Anyway, I'm really glad you're here. Let me know if you've got any questions. Uh, Tina, Remy the Good Witch, Buffet XXL, and Mrozgar. Thank you, thank you, Mark Melbourne, for the five gift subs. I appreciate that sincerely. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm washing away those ads for uh, five lucky mammals. Mark uh, Melbourne is washing away the ads for five lucky mammals. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mark. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Um, good stuff. Yeah. It's wonderful to have everybody here. Yeah, we interrupted some important news. Oh, yeah, Kakurex. I might not be streaming tomorrow or Wednesday or possibly Thursday. Because I've got some important, still secret, but very exciting stuff going on. 
with regard to fossil science here locally in the Bay Area. I hope to be making a big announcement about that on Friday. But that depends on how things go tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, just cross your fingers. We find some good fossils. That's all I'll say. For now. Uh, yeah. And Miyake Agent, yes, indeed, some dinosaurs did have feathers. A, a lot of dinosaurs, in fact. We're still trying to figure out which groups of dinosaurs in particular had feathers. But right now, we've got a very solid understanding that many of the theropod dinosaurs, the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs, did have feathers. That includes dinosaurs like Velociraptor. There we go. There's a pretty excellent feathered Velociraptor right there for you. Um, but it turns out that some groups of plant-eating dinosaurs may also have had feathers. We're not totally sure. Hello, Mini Pie. How are you doing? What's oh, shaking, Mini? I'm good to have you here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Here, let's get our cat cam going for a second here. There we go. Hello, Mini Pie. The ponderous Trachodon. Thank you, Alex Kumor, for the follow. And not a single cabin. Uh, Alex, thank you for following. Yeah. But yeah, we've got a, a really good understanding that a lot of dinosaurs would have had feathers, but we don't know how common that is necessarily. Where did feathers first evolve in the dinosaur family tree? Do feathers predate dinosaurs? Did all dinosaurs ancestrally have feathers? We're still kind of figuring that out. And Mika Duba, thank you for the follow as well. Hello, hello. Yeah. And hey, Belint, how are you doing, Science Streams? Howdy, howdy. Mini Pie says hello. Don't you, Mini? Yeah. Science. What science ever done for us? TV off. Fantasy Animal Vegan, thank you for the follow. Hello, hello. Yeah, and no worries, Science Streams. I'm glad you're here. I hope you've been having a good day. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of cool new people. I think this might be a perfect opportunity to introduce our good friend, previously recorded Danny. Uh, would anybody? Well, give me a one in the chat. If you'd like to little, if you'd like to know a little bit more about what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, what this channel is all about, all that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've convinced me. Uh, without further ado, hang on. Goodness. Sorry, he's very excited. Um, we'll turn things over to him in just a second, but that's previously recorded. Danny back there, he'll tell you a little bit about who I am, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, and uh, yeah, what this channel's all about. And this is a dinosaur too. Lico Tico, thank you for the follow. Good to have you here. Anyway, without further ado, uh, previously recorded, Danny, take it away. Well, thanks, present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, Kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college 
and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my field work, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, to help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazed. Oh, oh, oh my little range, where the, the deer, deer and the antelope play, play. our sails always heard of the scourging word, and the skies are not cloudy. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny, and of course, thank you even more 
to Genomator Frajdi for that enormous raid, and for uh, Kaze Raven, Kaze Raven of WH, thank you for the raid as well. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Sorry, we've got a cat being all rambunctious right now. Oh, mini pie. But I'm really glad you're here. Uh, Kaze, I'm sorry you raided right in the middle of a welcome video, but I'm glad you're here. Let me know if you or your raiders, first of all, whether or not you're still here. But, uh, let me know if you've got any questions about fossil science. Thank you for rating in. I appreciate it. Yeah, I got a cat hair in my eye. Mini Pie, you're a menace. You're a menace. Now, the dinosaurs rule. And, Zaraka, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. And Kazair says, I'm back. How are you doing? How was your stream? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know if you were still here, and I wanted to thank you for raiding in. I appreciate it. Ruins a movie by telling you how it ends. Well, I say there are some things we don't want to know. Oh no! Important thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Milo Bibu, thank you for the follow as well. How are you? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Lucas says, "How many of those shirts do you own? What do you mean the? How many shirts do I have? I don't know. A few." What do you mean, those shirts? All very different shirts I've been wearing. Um, yeah. I don't know. But yeah. Got a bunch done. Glad to hear it. Because i glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, Denny has one shirt, but he has it 20 times. Yeah, there you go, Rakedactylus. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. What were we talking about beforehand? Well, we're going to get into some fossil news, aren't we? Yeah. Asteroid. Yeah, we'll get into that. Without further ado, let's jump into some fossil news here. Well, well, well. Uh, welcome, everybody. To Fossil News. <laughs> I'm working on a new scene for that. Uh, kind of looks like a newsroom, but we we're going to get into this in just a second. We came here to find fossils. Uh, Najlepsi Rosnik, thank you for the follow, and welcome, welcome to the channel. I'm glad you're here. Let's give Mini Pie some treats, and then maybe... She won't be so keen to sit on my keyboard, huh, Mini Pie? Yeah? Alright. Then we'll, uh... We'll jump into this. There we go. Are you ready for some treats, Mini Pie? You into that? Oh, goodness. I'm pushing the camera around. There we go. How's that for you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and what is this? Emotional bagel? Let's protect our fossils, because... Thank you for subscribing. America loses them. Forever. I really appreciate the prime. Thank you, thank you for that. Good stuff. Holy cow. Uh... Uh, good stuff. And Hogan says, Glad to still have some of the greenies I sent. You bet. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Mini Pie certainly appreciates that. So does Sweetie Pie. Moon Pie doesn't care, because she doesn't like treats. But Mini Pie and Sweetie Pie are very appreciative. Look at that. Is that some good stuff, Mini? Is that some good stuff? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> hey, 
And Archie Core. Thank you for the follow. There are many more dinosaurs waiting to be discovered. Many new mysteries waiting to be pondered. Thank you very, very much for that follow. Yeah. Um and any idea on what the feathers were for, says Chicken Bacon Swiss? So different dinosaur feathers would have been for all kinds of different things. Some of them for insulation, for temperature regulation, some of them for display, some of them literally for gliding or for flying or for generating lift while flapping their arms to stay on top of their prey. Feathers are an extraordinarily versatile uh, kind of integument. And so... Be good for all kinds of different things. Maybe we'll watch a quick little video on that first, actually, because we've got some people who are kind of new to that idea. And, uh, yeah. What do you think, Mini Pie? Mm. There we go. Take a look at this. Uh, from Prehistoric Planet. Well, I'll see you later, Minnie. Thanks for being here. Uh... There's their lovely feathered velociraptor. I've got a project going with a feathered velociraptor, by the way, but you'll hear more about that later. The bones of dinosaurs are often very well preserved indeed, but that's not the case with the skin or the soft parts. Usually, so yeah. Imagining what they looked like has been largely a matter of guesswork. But now some truly exceptional fossils have been discovered yep. that have changed all that. One of the most startling discoveries has been the presence of feathers on a large number of species, including Velociraptor. Oh, yeah. We know for a fact that these guys had feathers. This is not speculation. The idea that dinosaurs like Velociraptor were fully feathered done deal. is no longer at all controversial. Yep. We currently know of about 60 dinosaur species that are completely covered in feathers, just like modern birds. Some of the most perfect fossilized feathers have been discovered in China. This is an image of a specimen that was found in 2015. It's called Zhen Zhuolong. <laughs> and you can probably guess from these huge claws on its feet that it was related to a velociraptor. But also, you can see amazingly perfect detail of feathers down its tail yep and more on its arms its wings for velociraptor in particular fossils have even been found with indentations in the bone yep quill knobs is what Showing they're called exactly a lot like on a turkey vulture would have been positioned yep so it would have looked very different from that scaly monster that we're familiar with. It would have been coated in lots and lots of feathers and would have looked a lot more like a kind of really terrifying turkey. Oh boy, don't say turkey. Ugh. The fossil evidence for feathers, maybe. An executive storm. Ooh, Thank you for the 48 months. What a time to be alive. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that, executive storm. Thank you so much for the 48 months. Holy cow. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for keeping me online for the past 48 months. Holy cow, executive storm. It's a long time. It's a very long time. Be clear and incontrovertible. Uh, but why would a flightless predator like Velociraptor need feathers? In the that's first? a bad one. There you go, snapping around. <laughs> a downy coat may soften their image as scaly reptilian killers. Uh, I don't know about that. Would have made Velociraptors even more deadly. Oh, yeah. Allowing them to attack unsuspecting prey where no other hunter would be able to venture. When we look at modern animals, we see that feathers are useful for so much more than just flying. Yep. So this goes to our question. If these animals weren't flying, what are the feathers for? Let's get into it. 
For an animal like Velociraptor, feathers would have helped to control movement, particularly yep. when the animal was leaping, climbing, or changing direction during a hunt. Feathers can also function as a kind of suit of armor, providing protection from the blows of prey, as well as from collisions with the environment. Yep. And that would have allowed them to succeed even in the most difficult terrains. Hmm. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Anyway, you get the idea. The reason why I don't like the turkey thing is because it's... It's just one of those things that people hear the the word turkey and suddenly they've got completely the wrong idea about what kinds of animals these were, you know? We've got really intimidating birds of prey around in our modern age. You don't have to go to turkey. Feathers doesn't equal turkey, you know? And it kind of gets into that old Jurassic Park uh, canard too about the six-foot turkey, you know? Uh, speaking of which... Should I play the that part of that, that cold open video? Let me know if I should. And, uh... Yes, please? Okay. I'm gonna skip through the, the countdown, so... You know, don't panic. We're not gonna watch a 10 minute countdown timer. I'm gonna quickly scrub through it. But then we'll get to our video, okay? Let's do that now. <laughs> Good shape, too. It's five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extraordinary. What did you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, they got it in for me. <laughs> and look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrist. It's not one of these guys learn how to fly. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present day birds than they do with reptiles. That doesn't look very scary. More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Turkey. Six-foot turkey. Turkey, huh? Six-foot turkey. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous Get your first look at this six foot turkey as you enter a clearing. So there you go. Yeah. Um, 
It kind of becomes scarier once you realize, too, that the, the feathers of Dromiosaur is like this. You know, the... What Jurassic Park trained people in the general public to call raptors, but Dromiosaurs. Velociraptor right there is number two. Microraptor is number one. Austroraptor. Utah Raptors, the big brown one there. These guys may have actually used their wings for flapping while they're standing on top of their their prey and sinking their big, you know, sickle toe claws into them to restrain them. So they just flap like that to stay upright while the prey is struggling, and much the way that like a golden eagle does today. And then they're just eating the soft parts while the prey is still struggling, while it's still alive. They're eating the guts or whatever, like birds of prey do today. These guys had wicked claws, and they had wings, despite the fact that they couldn't fly. They're too heavy for that. So stability flapping seems to make a lot of sense. This is a paper that was published by my old crew chief, Denver Fowler. Oh, Gamer L. Thank you. Paws on the wings are once For the again. 22 months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Good, Good stuff. I'm still alive. Yeah. Good to see y'all. Good to see you too, and I'm glad you're still alive, Gamer L. I'm glad to see you are welcome, welcome. Yeah. And holy cow, Axeman. I can see that my, uh... 12 months of support. Thank you, thank you for that. Spent. Now at tier 3, Axe Man. Holy cow. I appreciate that. And Gamer L, I appreciate you too. 22 months is a long time. Thank you, thank you, Gamer L. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, here is. Let's see, off, off, off. There we go. Really cool paper. But we've got, uh, got some decent evidence that dinosaurs like Deinonychus, a.k.a. the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, uh, that's what they use their claws for. The reason they've got these hypertrophy Digit 2 claws is that they would have used them to hook into their prey, to stay upright, and then flap while the prey, prey is struggling. Um, yeah, in order to be able to eat it. Just like modern birds of prey do. Yeah. It's called raptor prey restraint, is the hypothesis there. Yeah. Oh, and Rachel Darling Endeavors, um, I've got a bunch of uh, Philips Hue bulbs and the Lumia Stream program. So those uh, put together. I did some rejiggering of the stream setup over the weekend. Um, so the lights run off of Wi-Fi, but I was actually able to get my desktop computer hooked up to the Wi-Fi router, and uh, that way I was able to actually get it to be able to talk to the lights. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyhow, and I can go, uh, I can do some cool stuff like this. Let's see. Um, let's see. Let's try that. There we go. Stuff like this. Yeah. Do a rainbow one. Yeah. Anyway, I'm finding some ways to actually integrate that into the stream so it's more than just like a silly gimmick, you know? Uh, but I'm still new to this whole thing. I'm still figuring it out. And I honestly didn't know that it would be reacting to subscriptions and stuff like that so yeah anywho yeah good stuff and the sound is good again today the obs had another update i think that's part of it and then ios was also she sat down and helped me look at my audio a little bit and that may have contributed also well, anywho yeah um that being said let's get to our fossil news Uh, right here. This came out a couple days ago. Let's take a look at it. Um, 
First off, let me lay a little bit of background and say that the general consensus for what caused the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period, the one that drove all the dinosaurs extinct, all the ones living at the time except for a handful of birds, we think that was probably an asteroid impact. We've got the crater in the Gulf of Mexico. It's dated to the exact same time that the extinction occurred. So this is kind of our smoking gun. We've got multiple lines of evidence all pointing to this asteroid being the cause of the end Cretaceous extinction event. The one that wiped out the dinosaurs, ended the age of the dinosaurs. But where did that come from? You know? We've got a new paper that just came out talking about it. So let's get into it. Yeah. Uh, from SciTech Daily, the asteroid that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago probably came from the outer solar system. Researchers discovered that the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs originated from beyond Jupiter's orbit, shedding light on a rare cosmic event that caused massive changes on Earth about 66 million years ago. Uh, geoscientists from the University of Cologne have led an international study to determine the origin of the huge piece of rock that hit the Earth around 66 million years ago permanently changed the climate. It didn't permanently change the climate. What? They're writing that into there. This... Oh boy. Anyway, scientists analyzed rocks, rock samples from the layer that marks the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods. I actually have a sample of that right here in my necklace. Uh, I've got a sample of what we call the Z coal. This is the the boundary between the age of the dinosaurs and the age of mammals that we're currently living in right now. It's uh, it's important stuff, you know. Let's see if I can find you a clip describing this. Um. Let's see, I think... Is this it here? Mm, it's not. Try and find you. A clip? Where is that? Uh, it's with Kirk Johnson, and he's at a fossil site in Montana. You get the plants. There we go. So did the dinosaurs. For over a decade, Kirk Johnson and his team from the Denver Museum of Natural History have been combing the badlands of North Dakota for clues to one of science's greatest mysteries. The whole study of the extinction of the dinosaurs is complicated because here are these huge animals that lived on Earth for 150 million years. They became extinct 65 million years ago, yet it's quite hard to solve a crime that's 65 million years old. Thank you, Rachel Darling. I appreciate that. 65 million years ago. Yeah. Who done it? We now know it's 66. We've got more precise dating methods. Hundreds of square miles of parts it's been redated. along the Little Missouri River. The Dakota Badlands is one of the best spots on Earth where the mystery can be investigated. Where well Hey, Ken. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Ken. Crucial time just before. Hope you're doing well. It's good to see you. After the dinosaurs yeah. vanished. This is it. This is the horizon which marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Below this level, and out in here, there are dinosaur fossils. Above this level, on these rocks, there are no dinosaur fossils. So I'm actually standing on the level that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. We call it the KPG boundary. We used to call it the KT, but the terminology changed. The Cretaceous and the tertiary. That could have caused the dinosaurs to vanish. One of the most compelling clues is at our feet. 
in a telltale layer of clay. Yep. An analysis of a sample taken in Gubbio, Italy in 1978 revealed it to be rich in an element called iridium. Iridium. 77 protons. Normally rare in the Earth's crust, iridium is common in meteorites. Yep. And the Italian sample had over 30 times the normal concentration of iridium. That amount could only have come from outer space. Yep. The clay layer circles the world from New Zealand to North Dakota. In every instance, the clay contains high quantities of iridium. There was only one way so much iridium could have been spread around the world. A giant asteroid must have struck the Earth. Yep. The rock was blasted into a thick dust cloud loaded with iridium, which drifted round the world. For an asteroid to produce this much iridium dust, it must have been six miles wide and weighed a trillion tons. So this so, sort of big bang an asteroid the size of San Francisco. Evidence began to mount that a giant asteroid much crashed taller. into the Caribbean 65 million years ago. We now know it's 66, but uh, yeah. Here, and about that, uh, excuse me, about that here with the iridium. Oh, you know where this is. Holy cow. This is where I live. Right here in the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Yes, indeed. Uh, that's Berkeley, California, which is just just over there uh, um, the uh, University of California at Berkeley is right here and that's where some of these really important discoveries took place back in the uh, the 80s and 90s take a look to find out we sought help at the University of California at Berkeley from a Nobel Prize winning physicist someone he knew pretty well his father Louis Alvarez Louis loved a good mystery, no matter what field it was in. And that's how physics joined geology in the quest to explain the KT extinction. Now the KPG extinction. The terminology's tr terminology has changed. Alvarez looked at this layer, tried to figure out how you could determine the time scale. He brought in his knowledge of astrophysics. Do I know Louis? I, I don't, he wouldn't know me if, if he saw me, but I've met him a number of times. Um, he would come to various events at Berkeley. Um, sometimes if if we'd have a guest speaker, he would show up to the seminar there, and I've talked to him a few times. But, uh... Hang on. I always get them mixed up. Which one is the father and which is the son? Um, the father's the physicist. I think he's Walter Alvarez, and the son is Louis? Let's, let's see. No matter what field it was in. Yeah. And that's how physics joined geology in the quest to explain the KT extinction. Hang on. Nobel Prize winning physicist. Someone he knew pretty well. His father, Louis Alvarez. All right, it's Walter Alvarez that I've met then. Sorry. Louis loved a good mystery. Yeah. No matter Louis Alvarez is deceased. And that's how physics joined yeah. geology in the quest to explain the KT extinction. Alvarez looked at this layer, tried to figure out how you could determine the time scale. He brought in his knowledge of astrophysics, his knowledge of nuclear physics, and realized that there's an element that's relatively rare in the crust of the Earth that occurs in meteorites. Yep. The element was iridium, which falls steadily in an invisible rain of cosmic space dust. If the layer had taken thousands of years to form, Alvarez thought there might be just enough iridium to measure. Yep. But when the clay was tested, the scientists were stunned to find it contained 30 times more iridium than the surrounding rock. Nuts. It's what more they call the iridium spike. Samples from other KT sites had similar levels. Too much to come from ordinary space dust. Yep. What could explain so much iridium deposited around the world? Perhaps a catastrophic event in outer space. 
Alvarez wondered if a supernova exploding nearby might be responsible. Hmm. So again, this is what we do in science, is we come up with hypotheses and we test them. So we've got a weird anomaly. We're trying to figure out what's going on, so we devise ways of testing it. You know, maybe it's from a supernova. How do we test that idea? So he asked me if that was possible. And I concluded that there was only one chance in a billion that such a supernova would occur that close in 100 million years. Hmm. A supernova would have also deposited a rare isotope, plutonium-244. Ah. But so they can test. Field, Is it there? there wasn't any. No. Well, I None. suggested, alternatively, that it could have been an asteroid or a comet. Hmm. There are hundreds of asteroids whose paths cross the Earth's orbit. Their sizes range from a few meters to hundreds of kilometers across. So, Louis Alvarez had this hypothesis that an asteroid or comet would cause this destruction. He had the clue, the amount of iridium at Gubbio. Under this hypothesis, Gubbio in Italy, all around the world. Like we talked about so earlier. now he could calculate how much iridium there had been laid down over the entire Earth. Now, he also knew how much iridium there is in asteroids and comets, so he can now calculate the size of the object. The answer was sobering. An asteroid 10 kilometers in diameter, as large as Mount Everest. Huge. And weighing hundreds of billions of tons. Still, how could something that size wreak havoc on a large planet? Well, it happened to be where it hit. Through the vacuum of space, yeah. it would have slammed into the Earth's atmosphere at 80,000 kilometers per hour. Oof. 20 times faster than a bullet, heating the air to several times the temperature of the sun. At impact, the energy released would be equal to about 100 million nuclear bombs exploding at once. A huge mass of pulverized debris would have been blasted into space, some yeah, of it so. orbiting the Earth before raining back down. The debris may have blocked out the sun for months. Photosynthesis would have stopped. Plants, plant eaters, and then meat eaters would have died. This was the asteroid impact hypothesis for how the Mesozoic era ended. Yep. So where did that bolide, that asteroid, that impactor, where did that come from? Now that we've set the groundwork for this, we'll get into it. And Anakin Gabriel has a question. Fossils near Chicxulub Bridge. I don't think there are a great number of fossils from there. A lot of those would have been destroyed at the time if we're talking about foraminifera, like microscopic oceanic organisms and stuff like that. We don't have any dinosaur fossils from nearby. I can tell you that. Um... Yeah, yeah, but a lot of this area was just, as you can see, just blown away, destroyed. A real dinosaur? <laughs> Melipetna, thank you for the follow. <laughs> Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, study published in Science indicates that the asteroid formed outside Jupiter's orbit during the early development of our solar system. Uh, we just talked about this, like kind of the general outline of how that occurred. But the dust particles released by the impact formed a layer of sediment around the entire globe. That's why the Cretaceous Paleogene, or KPG, boundary can be identified and sampled in many places on Earth. It contains high concentrations of platinum group metals, which come from the asteroid and are otherwise extremely rare in the rock that forms the Earth's crust. By analyzing the isotopic composition of the platinum metal ruthenium in the clean room laboratory of the University of Cologne's Institute of Geology and Mineralogy, the scientists discovered that the asteroid originally came from the outer solar system. And how could they tell that? The asteroid's composition is consistent with that of carbonaceous asteroids that formed outside of Jupiter's orbit during the formation of the solar system, said Dr. Mario Fischer Goda, first author of the study. The ruthenium isotope compositions were also determined from other craters and impact structures of different ages on Earth for comparison. Data shows that within the last 500 million years, 
almost exclusively, fragments of S-type asteroids have hit the Earth. In contrast to the impact of the Cretaceous-Paleogean boundary, these asteroids originate from the inner solar system. Well over 80% of all asteroid fragments that hit the Earth in the form of meteorites come from the inner solar system. Professor Dr. Karst Karsten Münker, co-author of the study, added, We found that the impact of an asteroid like the one at Chicxulub is a very rare and unique event in geological time. I mean, it can't be very rare and unique. Unique means like a one-off. That means there's only one. So of course it's very rare. Anyway. The fate of the dinosaurs and many other species was sealed by this projectile from the outer reaches of the solar system. Pretty cool stuff. Here is the uh, the actual paper in the journal Science. Kind of got to be careful with science sometimes. I don't know, especially with like. I don't know. I'm sure in other fields it's great, but with dinosaur science in particular, sometimes they publish some real garbage in science. Um, you got to watch out for those, you know, the high-profile like tabloid journals like Science and Nature. But anyway, unfortunately, this is paywalled. So we will not be looking Access at that. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a link to it anyway, in case you happen to have journal access through a university or something like that. Yeah. And that's okay, Rachidactylus. There's not going to be a lot in this that I'm going to be able to comment on because I'm not an astronomer or planetary geologist or anything like that. Nor a chemist. Um, yeah, I know next to nothing about isotopes. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting stuff. Ugh, excuse me, well, at least look at the abstract. Um... Elevated concentrations of platinum group elements, including ruthenium. We measured ruthenium isotopes in samples taken from three boundary sites. It would be nice to know where those sites are from. Yeah. Our data indicate that the Chicks Loop impactor was a carbonaceous type asteroid, which had formed beyond the orbit of Jupiter. The five other impact structures of isotopic signatures that are more consistent with siliceous type asteroids, which are formed closer to the sun. The ancient spherical layer samples are consistent with impacts of carbonaceous type asteroids during Earth's final stages of accretion. So we do have a bunch of other craters from around the world at other times. Uh, Meteor Crater in Arizona is probably a, a well-known example there. This is from a much, much smaller impact or that would have come from closer to the sun. So I guess the way that it works is I'm grossly oversimplifying here, but within our solar system, you got the sun in the center and everything orbiting around it. Closer to the center, you get all kinds of small things twirling around, orbiting the sun. And then the further out you move, the bigger some of these things get. You know? Think about like Pluto, which used to be considered a planet because it's pretty large for uh, something orbiting the sun. But it turns out no, you go out that far and there are things that are just really big out there that are orbiting. Something from beyond the orbit of Jupiter smashed into the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and paved the way for us, the mammals. It's pretty interesting to realize that, like, that was... It was a big thing, you know? It's not like that was a, a run-of-the-mill impact. It was something really, really big, pretty far out in the solar system. That's cool to know. I don't know about you, but my life is a little bit enriched knowing that. It kind of further outlines... How well, that that was a unique event, you know? Pretty cool to think about. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, 
And Patrick Crusader had a question. What are your thoughts about the new study saying the asteroid was a mud belt? We're talking about that right now. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about, Patrick Crusader. That's... Uh, that's this paper. Where did it go? There we go. Yep. Yeah. Anywho, I'm t monolith from very funny Sorphagenax. <laughs> yeah, and isolated. I have seen the movie. Don't look up. Absolutely, uh, it's one of the scariest movies I've seen in a long time because it's so incredibly realistic. Honestly. Oh boy, it is a little too real, Claire. Yeah, yeah. Anywho, like Idiocracy. Idiocracy is a stupid movie and like a bad film. I don't know. Uh, I'm not a fan of Idiocracy. <laughs> but don't look up. A legitimately frightening movie. Just in the sense that it is very real, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I know a lot of people like Idiocracy. I was severely disappointed by it. I thought it was an interesting premise. Not handled well. Just a profoundly stupid movie. Uh. Anyway. Let's maybe take a look at some of the other news items around this. And let's see if we can, oh boy. Now, turns out YouTube is not the place to find this. Oh, let's take a look at this. Dinosaur killing asteroid was likely a giant mud ball. Oh, boy. Stone says 66 million. Uh, Calaveras, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Oh, boy, this is going to be like an AI-generated piece of garbage, isn't it? Years ago, the story of life on Earth took a dramatic turn. Yeah, no thanks. Um, thumbs down. This will be some decent reporting from Nature. It's interesting that Nature is reporting on this because their uh, their arch rival, the journal Science, is the journal in which this paper was published. But yeah, um, I'm not sure where people are getting the mud thing. Like, oh, it was a giant mud ball? It's carbonaceous, you know, containing lots of carbon and volatile chemicals. I don't know how that gets translated into mud ball, but apparently, like, a lot of different uh, news outlets have gone with that. There we go. From CNN, MSN, um, Muslim News, Live Science, Earth Sky. Oh, that's something different. Anyway, let's look at it from CNN and see if they butchered this or do they do it well. Let's see. 66 million years ago. Well, mark in their favor so far. They got the number right. Story of life on Earth took a dramatic turn when an asteroid collided with what's now the Yucatan Peninsula in Chicx Loop, Mexico. The after effects of the collision resulted in the extinction of an estimated 75% of animal species, including most dinosaurs except for birds. It should be all dinosaurs except for birds. But yeah. Uh, but practically nothing of the asteroid itself remains. A new study published Thursday in the journal Science, researchers pieced together the chemical identity of the asteroid that fueled the planet's fifth mass extinction event. 
Now, the Dino Killer was a rare clay-rich mud ball. Again, where does this come from, mud ball? I wonder if it's something that the authors actually put in the press release. You know? And Sora Phagenax wants to know, when did it change from 65 to 66 million years ago? An armored giant, wreaking his prehistoric... Get to that in a second. ...on modern man and his puny machines. Cold Knox, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, that was around 2012, 2013 that that changed. Um, here, let me see if I can find you the, uh, the paper redating that. References. Uh, here it is here, I believe, 2013. Time scales of critical events around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Uh, Paul Rennie who is a geochronologist just down the road from me in Berkeley, California. Yeah, Paul Rennie. Um, I've worked with, uh, with some of his students, including, is that? Is that her right there? Um, oh, goodness. Courtney. Is that Courtney right there? Courtney joined our crew in the field in 2014, I believe. Um, yeah, Courtney Sprain. <laughs> uh, and she is now a leading geochronologist in her own right. I think she has her own laboratory somewhere in... The Midwest or the Middle South? Uh, let's see. But Courtney's awesome. Yeah, there University of Florida. Well, well, well. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. No, Courtney's super cool. Um, and does she have a Twitter? I guess she does. Awesome. Anywho, the whole point was, like, here is the the paper. Um, when it was changed from 65 million years ago to 66. With better dating methods, we've been able to, to more precisely determine when the asteroid impact took place. And now we say 66 instead of 65. Back in the day, you know, like when Jurassic Park came out, uh, the tagline for it was an adventure 60, 65 million years in the making. Now we realize it should be 66. But yeah, yeah. Anywho. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, we'll get back to our press release here. Uh, Fisher Goda's team found that the ruthenium isotopes in the Chicxulub impactor were a good match for carbonaceous asteroids from the outer solar system and did not match siliceous asteroids from the inner solar system. Uh, the ruthenium isotopes also provide evidence against another hypothesis that the Chicxulub impactor was a comet rather than an asteroid. The idea was uh, the idea it was a comet goes back far into the literature, says William Botka, planetary scientist at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. The hypothesis was revived in a controversial 2021 study, which argued that the impactor was part of a long period comet that had broken up under the sun's gravitational pull. But Fisher good at says that the ruthenium isotope data do not match a comet. Gulick agrees. He adds that geochemical evidence from the Chicxulub impact site has never been consistent with a comet, and the latest study does a really good job of nailing that home. I don't know where the mud ball thing comes from, though. The word mud doesn't show up in this, but it's all over the uh, CNN press release.
Anywho. If you want something uh, a little bit more carefully written, check this out. Check out this press release from Nature. Anywho. Yeah. Those salacious asteroids, says <laughs> Malia again. Uh... Did I say salacious? It's a... Whatever. Yeah. Is it because it was clay rich, I assume? I'm not even sure if they say clay rich in the actual... The word clay doesn't appear anywhere in here. I haven't looked at the actual paper, but... That might be some, like, weird editorializing from the popular press. Calling it clay rich. Clay, I always think of as like a grain size sort of a deal. And that would be. I don't know. I don't think it has anything to do with clay. I think that might be just a weird thing that, you know, journalists were getting a little bit confused and then using the word clay when that might not actually have anything to do with the. with the actual paper itself. I'm not sure. A clay is a. Phyllosilicate containing mass? I mean, not in all cases, though, right, Jody Fish? Uh. But yeah. Oh, and salacious sounds like salacious. I see what you mean, Ken. Okay. Yeah. Made of water and clay. Interesting, Patrick Crusader. But an, an asteroid wouldn't be made of. water. That would be a comet, right? Comets are largely icy. Uh, I don't... My impression is not that asteroids are like that. Again, I'm not a planetary geologist or an astronomer or anything like that. Yeah. Anywho. Um, yeah. And Hecky for Life says, is climate change a subcategory of your studies? I don't specialize in studying changing climates myself, but there are other paleontologists who definitely do. And other geologists and other earth scientists, for certain. Yeah, studying the, the changes in Earth's climate over Earth history? Certainly. Um, and changing climates do definitely have bearing on the stuff that I study, for sure. Uh, are we accelerating the process? We're driving the process right now, Hecky. It's really bad. There's a volcano or asteroid uh, plum cause more damage versus cars, etc. Here's the thing, Hecky. Um, here. As a paleontologist, you know, I study the history of life on Earth. Dinosaurs in particular, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that I am definitely aware of, and I and privy to a lot of research done by my colleagues on other extinction events and stuff like that throughout Earth history. Right now, the the changes in climate that Earth is undergoing because of greenhouse gases that people are emitting, these are causing changes in Earth's climate that are almost unprecedented. I'll, I'll say that they are unprecedented in the sense that they're, the climate is changing faster than it has ever changed before, with one possible exception, and that's the extinction of the dinosaurs. The KPG extinction. The end Cretaceous extinction event. The Permian extinction, where like 90% of life on Earth was wiped out, was also caused by like massive releases of greenhouse gases, but that happened on such a longer time scale than we're currently in. Let me make that very, very clear. The climate change that people are driving right now is like maybe an order of magnitude faster, maybe multiple orders of magnitude faster than the end Permian extinction event. The great dying, the greatest extinction event of all time, the most devastating biotic crisis that Earth has ever experienced, that happened a lot more slowly than what we are doing right now. And we have the potential to do something even worse. 
unless we change things like immediately. So it's bad. It's really bad. Uh, ask any paleontologist. Ask any geologist. Ask you know, any climatologist. They'll tell you. So, yeah. Sorry, don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but I would be derelict to my duties if I did not tell you straight up, you know? The point of me doing these broadcasts is to, you know, to be honest with you and to, to tell you what I know and communicate the science to the best of my ability. So there you have it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there you go. Sorphagenax makes a good point. Climate change is normal to a certain extent. It can be caused by external factors, but it's something that occurs usually very, very slowly so that ecosystems have a chance to adapt. Organisms can evolve to acclimate themselves to ch changing conditions. Right now, we're changing the climate way too fast for that. Yeah, we're changing the weather in less than 500 years. Changing the climate in less than 500 years. Sorry, Phaedra next, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Rachodactylus makes a good point too. Ask any physicist, since they also study heat exchange and transfer. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anywho, and well, 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 Mini Mabel, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It is good to have you here. Holy cow! And their sixteen raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. W were you just in here a little while ago, or am I mistaking you for somebody else? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It is wonderful to have you here. Shoot. Uh, if you're here for the very first time, and I know some of you are, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Jurassic Park. Let's protect our fossils. Uh, sorry, this is not focusing properly. America loses them forever. Apologies. Uh, JP2855, thank you for the follow. Um, Mini Mabel, I really appreciate the raid. How did your stream go? Tell me how it went. And uh, let me know if anybody's got any questions it's about fossil science. Version of heaven. About dinosaurs, about the history of life on Earth. Tellerina, uh, Orania, and Mirek, thank you for the follows. It is great to have you here. Hello, hello. Many Mabel says it was great. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, and Hecky, I appreciate you asking your question in earnest. And, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't have a reassuring answer, but, you know, that's the way it is. Jenny Badger, well, well, well. Thank you for subscribing and welcome to Paleontologizing. Let's protect our fossils. There we go. If they're removed, America loses them. Forever. Our alert was a little bit delayed there, but thank you. Thank you, Jenny Badger, for that recurring tier one sub. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for that pledge of ongoing support. I really appreciate that. This is my full-time job, so anytime somebody subscribes, that helps put food on my table. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Since we've got a, a bunch of cool new people here with Minnie Mabel, would anybody like to see a, a welcome video? Type a one into chat if you'd like to see a, a video kind of welcoming you to uh, to the channel, ten, telling you what this is all about, explaining why a paleontologist is on here in the first place, all that good stuff. I'm seeing some ones. Excellent. Well, without further ado, we're going to call forth a good friend of ours again. We call him Previously Recorded Danny, and he is currently sneaking up behind me. He's going to tell you all that stuff. 
what this channel is all about, who I am, why a paleontologist is on this platform in the first place. So without further ado, previously recorded Danny, take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada. But most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's, uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the west coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two... Three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. But finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. 
I am no I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present-day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present-day Danny, back to you. Thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. Of course, thank you even more to Minnie Mabel for the raid. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let me know if you got any questions. Uh, um, I need to really, when I've got some time, make some updated versions of those videos with previously recorded Danny. Because a lot's changed since then. I've done a ton of field work and live streamed a bunch of it since starting that. Got Twitch partner, I've gone full time. I'm no longer teaching full time like that. Um, only just doing a little bit of teaching here and there. Honestly, it's kind of wonderful because I get to make my own schedule and be here on Twitch five days a week, make my living this way. I'm incredibly lucky to be able to do that. And that's because of the support of wonderful people like you, Jenny Badger, new subscriber. I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And RDA, we've got some stuff that we've got to go back and get next year. Uh, we weren't able to get all of the bones out from the quarry this past, or, you know, a couple weeks ago. So we've got some stuff waiting for us. And hopefully... You know, it'll still be there. Hopefully, uh, we won't have vandals or ne'er-do-wells or fossil poachers trying to steal things. Um, yeah, we definitely did take some measures to prevent theft, but you never know. It's a long time until next summer. So we'll see. Yeah. Anyhow. Before we get into some more fossil news, I've got something I've got to get done on today's stream. And that's to assemble a 3D printed dinosaur skull that just finished printing this morning. Very excited about that. Um... There we go. See another day. To help introduce this, uh, well, maybe you have heard about this here. This has been in the news lately, and we'll kind of use this to segue into our 3D print assembly. <sighs> We're here at our new Jeruth Pearlstein Welcome Center, and we're under construction, as you can tell. There's a lot of work going on. We're Check this out. We're this amazing 75-foot-plus dinosaur to, dis to our display here in the museum. It takes a huge community of people to bring a dinosaur from deep in the ground to a museum mount. And so every step along the way, there's large communities of excavators, volunteers, preparators, people mounting the dinosaur. So we wanted to continue that community so this process. is the Natalie specimen. Natalie dinosaur by opening up a contest and letting the public give this dinosaur its name. 
I'd like to introduce you to Natalie. Natalie, spelled with a G N A T. Natalie, because of the that skull there. Oh. Who were taking the dinosaur bones out of the dirt. Are we talking about that? Natalie is a Diplodocus like dinosaur. It's a long necked, which means a, a sauropod dinosaur. And she was found in the Badlands of Utah in 2007. We exist as a museum, as a community resource, right? We are a place that, in partnership of, for, and with Los Angeles, and we want to put these objects on display. A specimen like Natalie, it takes teams of people from not only our that community, skull. national teams of scientists to study and do the research and do yeah. the work to get this on display. And so we have uh, a lot of things on display in this welcome center that are-, are Hey, Volcano Doc. Howdy, howdy. The ...for their experience as they come in for the rest and see the rest of the museum. Pretty cool stuff. I did a live stream from the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History a few years ago. But the reason I'm showing you this is this is the same kind of dinosaur that we're going to be assembling today. Um, yeah, ours is not a real fossil skull, and theirs is not a real fossil skull either. This skull that they have attached to it is a cast of the Dippy Diplodocus specimen. This really, really famous dinosaur, arguably the world's most famous dinosaur, uh, at least prior to Sue. There's a whole story behind this. And uh, again, to be clear, the skeleton that they're assembling here is a composite. So there's a bunch of different fossil bones, genuine fossil bones from the Morrison Formation of North America, late Jurassic period, about 150 million years old. There's a bunch of bones of different individual sauropod dinosaurs in here. This is what we call a composite, but they didn't have a skull. Skulls are extremely rare to find in sauropod dinosaurs. So the skull that they're using here is a cast of Dippy's skull. And there's a, a storied history there with Dippy. Let's watch this little clip. Much of what we know about Diplodocus is the result of American philanthropy on the grand scale. Not long after the Bone Wars were over, another American millionaire became fascinated by dinosaurs. Andrew Carnegie, who made a fortune out of steel, read a story in the New York Journal of 1898. Yeah. The headline said, biggest dinosaur ever found. Andrew Carnegie wanted it. He wanted it for his museum in Pittsburgh. And what Andrew Carnegie wanted, he usually got. He immediately dispatched a man with a check for ten thousand dollars and the orders buy it in 1895 here we'll we'll get to this in a second hrm moose says why are skulls rare to find uh especially with sauropod dinosaurs their skulls are very rare to find because they're very lightweight there's kind of loose connections between some of the individual bones um and the connection between the neck and the head can be fairly weak um, and so the head just had a tendency to fall off after the animal died. Maybe meat eaters were eating it, but, you know, we'll talk about that in a bit too. When I actually do the assembly here, uh, we can talk about, but, but this is the specimen that our 3d print is a copy of here. Carnegie had made his fortune in railroads and steel, and he decided to give to Pittsburgh a, a palace of culture. And the palace had four columns. One was art, another was literature, another was music, and the fourth was science. A very funny volcano doc. Science meant dinosaurs. Yeah, Diplodocus. So here's the original. Uh... Carnegie's money bought him the best bone hunters of the day. But no amount of searching, it seemed, would unearth the skeleton he yearned for. Two months later, his investment paid off. Carnegie's diggers struck lucky. Very hmm. lucky. What they found was this, a giant toe bone of a dinosaur sticking out of the rock. And they got very excited because when they started excavating the rock from around the toe bone, they found that the toe bones led to the ankle bones, and the ankle bones led to the shin bones of the dinosaur, and the shin bones led to the proverbial thigh bones of the dinosaur. It was the most perfect July 4th that any paleontologist has ever had, 
and Carnegie got exactly what he paid for, an 84-foot colossal dinosaur. <laughs> uh. So there's the skull right there. Take a good look. It, it was named Star Spangled Dinosaur uh, because it was found on July 4th, uh, Independence Day. It probably wasn't actually found on July 4th, but that's the story anyway. Not only the toast of Pittsburgh and the toast of North America, but it became the toast of the world. It was became so wildly popular. And a tavern song was written in honor of the Plotticus, uh, which only had one verse, at least one verse that has survived, that went something like, the crowned heads of Europe all make a royal fuss over Uncle Andy and his old Diplodocus. <laughs> Uncle Andy must have loved it. Uh, he paid for it, and uh, he got everything he paid for and more. Casts of Diplodocus carnegii were made for yep. and installed in Paris, in Vienna, in... This Bologna, is a huge deal. I just read a book about this this in, summer. In uh, Leningrad, in La Plata, in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires. That really set the stage for the popularity of dinosaurs and yep. the great studies on dinosaurs. So for many, many, many people around the world, this is the first dinosaur that they ever saw. You know, in the early part of the 20th century, Diplodocus was the dinosaur. If you're somebody living in Spain or in Argentina or in Russia, you know, you might not really have a conception of what a dinosaur is until you start reading these newspapers and Andrew Carnegie is donating a replica of his Diplodocus specimen to your country, usually as like a gift to a head of state, to a crown prince or a king or a queen or whatever. And then they would put that in a major museum and then huge throngs of people would come to see that. This is before most people had any idea what a dinosaur was. And so Diplodocus was this cultural phenomenon at the time. A huge deal. Here's the book. Uh, I highly recommend if you're if you're interested in kind of like the early history of well in like the early 20th century history of dinosaur paleontology and kind of dinosaurs as a kind of cultural touchstone. And the book is called An American Dinosaur Abroad. Um, and it's all about these casts of Dippy being created by Andrew Carnegie and his crew. And, uh, you know, this animal kind of taking the world by storm that way. No other creature in the world looks like a half-plucked turkey and walks like a pot-bellied bear. Death of Barney, thank you for the 19 months of support. I really appreciate that. I agree, Death of Barney. Shoot, I'm waiting for a, a new bookcase to be delivered here. A little one. In order to house, I've run out of space around my bookshelf. Um, my bookcases just, they're all full, you know? Don't have any more room for any other new books. So. Anywho. Yeah, good stuff. Um. So the Dippy specimen. Uh, here's the article for it from Wikipedia. You can read all about this. And the reason I pull this up is we've got a list of different places around the world where you can see a plaster cast of Dippy. The NHM, Natural History Museum in London, was the first one. This was actually before Diplodocus even went on display in Pittsburgh. Prior to uh, to that mount going on display, the one in London was already announced and unveiled and everything. So this is really Dippy's uh, introduction to the world was a plaster cast in London, or the real bones went up on display back home in Pennsylvania. We've got one in Berlin, one in Paris, in Austria, in Italy, in Russia, in Argentina, in Spain, in Mexico City, in Munich. And in Vernal, Utah, as well. And I actually did a stream from the Utah Fieldhouse of Natural History State Park Museum. Boy, is that a mouthful. 
uh, a few years ago, and I think we have that VOD here. Let's see. Yep, here we go. I like how these have been considered. They kind of showed the world what dinosaurs looked like. I'll tell you the story. So back in the late 1800s, uh, there were American paleontologists striking out across the West in kind of the Wild West days. I'll get to your question in a second, Volcano Doc. Interesting and impressive yeah. fossils to bring back to the East Coast to put in their museums. And uh, at one point, there were some researchers who were out there looking for sauropod dinosaurs. And uh, they actually got some funding from the, like, super wealthy industrialist Andrew Carnegie. He financed their work and financed the discovery and excavation of this dinosaur skeleton. This is back in a time when dinosaurs were still fairly new, and most people in the general public had never seen a dinosaur before. Now, some people here in the chat are going to be familiar with the Crystal Palace dinosaurs in England, how they were kind of like a way to introduce the general public to what scientists thought dinosaurs looked like at the time. Way Different Carnegie there snapping the rounds. <laughs> this is arguably far more important than the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, because that was a big deal in England and in Europe, but this dinosaur here, which was named Diplodocus Carnegie, huh? Diplodocus Carnegie, I think that's... I've heard Carrie or Matt Waitle say. It's squashed completely flat. Uh, the bone wall is so thin. Ariana Celestine. The same dimension as the wall of a dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt, dirt, dirt. Well, that's what this dirt, thing dirt. is like. First uh, pitch, baby, for this channel. Ariana Celestine, thank you so much for the nine months of support. I really appreciate you. Dirt, thank dirt. you, thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Dirt, dirt. And Marcy Walks Dogs. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Together in one vast supercontinent. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Dinosaurs soon occupied every corner of that. Dirt, dirt. I really appreciate that, Marcy. Four months of support. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Lovely. <laughs> and holy cow, Miss Capri Kel, thank dirt, you for the ten gift subs there. Extraordinary. Dirt, dirt. Look, we're well on our way to uh to make our goal this week. Thank you, Miss Capri. Uh look at how excited this Tinamu bird is. For your generosity there. I Oh shoot. Miss Capri Kell is overloading the system with ten gift subs. Holy cow! If you're feeling a bit cheated, try Thank you, thank you. And now we have a hype train. We do indeed, Ariana. Thank you for the hundred bits there. Excellent. <laughs> Miss Capri, thank you for the ten gift subs there. There's ten people in the chat. We won't have to worry about any ads for the next 30 days, thanks to your generosity. I appreciate that very much. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um. Here we were. We were talking about Dippy here. Let me go back to where we were. Skip forward just a bit. There we go. Around the world. Uh, so you will see an exact copy of this specimen in the museum in Paris. You'll see one in London. I think there's one in... Uh, thank you, Lordy. Uh, there is indeed, Lordy. And there's you on screen there, too. I think there's one in Buenos Aires. You remember this, Lordy? And so Andrew Carnegie, you know, <laughs> he was originally from Scotland, but he was immensely proud of his adoptive new home in the United States. And he wanted to share parts of America's wonderful fossil heritage with other people around the world. And so... That was part of it. He also wanted to help prevent future wars by fostering friendships between countries, and he thought giving them dinosaurs as gifts was a way to do that. Unfortunately, that didn't work out so well, because World War I happened shortly thereafter. But, uh, yeah. Here, let's get back around to the skull over here. Mr. National Monument. Uh... I you can walk right underneath it's posed and everything, and the fact that... Yeah. Uh, you can walk right underneath her. There you go, Lordy, yes. I mean... There's the skull. So cool. And Kuasil, that's the same Carnegie from Carnegie Hall. So it's named after Andrew Carnegie, because he 
paid for that. Do you have any questions right now? Um, just are you headed to the quarry tomorrow? We are, yeah, at Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, try and get there as soon as it opens tomorrow. It's gonna be really cool. Look at that. Rib cage right there. Big pel pelvic bones. Yeah. There's a great book about this, actually. Oh, yeah, another um, book. I think it's called The Bone Wars by Tom Rea, I want to say. Yes, indeed. It's all yeah. about Diplodocus, <laughs> about the discovery and excavation and unveiling of, of this skeleton here. Yeah, here it is right here. Bone Wars by Tom Rea, the excavation and celebrity of Andrew Carnegie's dinosaur. Uh... 20th anniversary edition just came out a couple years ago, and will, will you look at that? With a new forward by Matthew C. Lamana. Hmm. Does anybody recognize that name? Matt Lamana. Hmm. Thank you, anonymous gifter. I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, Matt Lamana wrote a new forward for the 20th anniversary edition. Yeah. There we go. Matthew C. Lamana, Associate Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. So... Matt Lamana, of course, was on my crew in Wyoming back in June. Miss Capri Kell gifted a tier one sub to confuse the kidnapper. Sure. They have given 288 gifts. Thank you, Miss Capri Kell. I appreciate that. Yeah. Nice. Is it? Well established that they are dromaeosaurs, or is that still controversial? There we go. Uh, Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> uh, good stuff. Uh, or maybe we can move the chairs a little closer. That's apologizing. Museum. Matt with Dinosaur cur Curator of Pittsburgh's Carnegie Museum, Matt Lamana. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for <laughs> taking some time out to talk with everybody. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, yeah, should be fun, just kind of a chill, short little interview. Yeah, sure. And uh, so anybody, if you've got any questions at all uh, pertaining to dinosaurs, pertaining to museum work, pertaining to, I don't know, what else are you uh, eager um, to talk about? I would say, like, in particular, my knowledge base is mostly southern hemisphere dinosaurs and yeah. sort of, um, and kind of, uh, you know, dinosaur museums, I guess. Can we so, change the camera right, angle a little? This is not a great yeah, angle the whole again, time, just but for whatever. Context for anybody who uh, maybe wasn't able to catch any of our earlier streams, uh, Matt Lamana has done a ton of field work all over the world, digging up different dinosaurs in all kinds of cool exotic places. Exotic sounds like almost <laughs> condescending or something like that. But. I mean, that's the, I, mean I, I, I think some are pretty exotic, so yeah. Yeah, no yeah. Um, and shoot, I've told you this already, but when I was a kid, there is this TV show that my dad taped for me called The Lost Dinosaurs of Egypt. Uh, I think I was about 10 years old, and I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. This group of paleontologists go out to Egypt, uh, to try and sort of rediscover some of the these mysterious Egyptian dinosaurs, many of which, I think pretty much all of which at that point, had been destroyed in World War II. 100%. And Matt Lamana was on that crew, and so I watched that tape so many times I practically wore it out. <laughs> and now, you know, get to have Matt out here in the field with us, and now you're on my show, which I is know, and you're, crazy. And you've been, uh, <laughs> you've been a lifesaver to me and my my team, my people as well from Pittsburgh. Well, shoot, so, I appreciate yeah. that. No, this it's been... dude is one of the best field people I've ever worked with. No joke. <laughs> yep. And wow, even, he's blushing. not paying me to say that. And this this is only my second beer, so. <laughs> no, no I'm I'm beyond flattered. Danny is fantastic, absolutely fantastic, and I um. And I'm so grateful when I hear stories like what you talked about, about that show being meaningful to you. I yeah. mean, uh, you, it was, it was a certainly a really me meaningful experience in my life. And, um, you know, we, 
we were hoping it would have an impact on people and you know like definitely did happily, i think it has so definitely yeah yeah. yeah yeah i'm sure you inspired a lot of people to to get into paleontology it was that. i will say like a, it was about probably anyway um if you want to watch the whole thing here is a link but anyway back to uh dippy the diplodocus here um here i think yeah there's this um spindly the cuddle virtues spindly to just like animals anyway May, there's this like is just to say that dippy is a big deal specimens in the entire world where we can tell if they were male or female for messes of yeah uh let's take a look at this i've not seen this before hall here at carnegie museum and we're in front of a very famous uh, fossil skeleton we're going to talk with dr craig c black who is the curator of the uh, vertebrate fossil can you tell us about so craig black is a precursor to uh to matt lamana yeah uh, Yes, I'd be happy to. This is, as you said, probably the most famous dark dinosaur at Carnegie Museum. Yep. And also one of the most famous in the world. Definitely. This dinosaur was discovered in what is now the Dinosaur National Park near Vernal, Utah, in 1903. On a small section of and the And they go Charlie's Dragon, yes. At that point by Earl <laughs> Douglas, who was a curator in the department. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Carnegie had wanted, had gotten very interested in dinosaurs after a newspaper article uh, in one of the New York papers. Yep. And he immediately. The lighting here is not Douglas great. To go out and find one, Douglas did, and for a period of about 15 to 18 years, Carnegie Museum worked the dinosaur quarry in Utah, and this was one of the first specimens to come out. It was called Diplodocus carnegii. So he's got that wrong. No, the dippy specimen comes from sheep. Sheep Creek in Wyoming? Uh, the Apatosaurus specimen, Apatosaurus louise, that Andrew Carnegie paid for its excavation of and everything. It was named after his wife Louise, Apatosaurus louise. That comes from Utah, from the Dinosaur National Monument Quarry, if I remember correctly. So, uh, yeah, the curator here got that wrong. It is one of the large sauropods. And there you go, Volcano about Doc, yeah. Million years ago. <laughs> the total length was probably about 60 feet. Dinosaurs. Anyway, no. living at the same and the total length of this, it's like 84 feet long. What is he talking about? He's getting all these things wrong. Time uh, uh, with the Plotticus on his back. Uh, Stegosaurus, yeah. Anyway, the point is, Dippy is a big deal, and we're going to be assembling her skull right now. So let's do it. Yeah. Uh. uh let me get my workspace set up for this. There we go. And uh, this is going to be large, just so you know, so you're prepared. And it might be difficult to fit everything in frame, but we're going to do our best. I've already assembled a few different parts. This is the eye socket right here. We've got part of the snout. And uh, yeah, it's my only assembled pieces so far. But since I don't have a very large 3D printer, I had to digitally break this up into smaller pieces in order to be able to get them to fit on the print bed. And so now we're going to do our assembly. Yeah. And Sorphagenax, uh, I have read that Michael Crichton book. I was disappointed by it, I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, it was mostly posthumous. He, di he died long before that was finished. Um, I think he actually may have started writing it before Jurassic Park, but yeah. And this is life-size Cactus Jack. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, we're going to start gluing this. So, let's get into it. I figure I might as well start with the back right here. Blue is cheap. Yeah. Um, and thank you, generic spinoff. Observation. You couldn't see a thing. Conclusion. Dinosaurs. <laughs> generic spinoff, thank you for the three months of support. I appreciate you. Thanks for keeping me here online. 
Uh, and from Volcano Dog, legit question. Met an undergrad interested in doing uh, vert, preferably dinosaur paleontology. The first armored tank, you might say. Thank you, Space Cat Streams, for the follow. Good to have you here. Uh, other than academic or full-time dinosaur science streamer, which careers would you say are out there for somebody who wants to do dinosaur paleontology and make their living at it? There's not that many, honestly. Um, it's tricky. Uh, but there are a lot of dinosaur paleontologists. We just talked about this on Thursday, I think. Um... There are a few paleontologists who make their living teaching anatomy at medical schools or sometimes veterinary colleges or even dental schools sometimes. Um, and then there's a lot of like paleo monitoring work too. So uh, if you live in a state where the fossils are protected under law, like at construction sites and stuff like that, then they usually need a paleontologist on staff to help make sure things are not getting destroyed while they're building a new... I don't know. Uh, server farm for AI-generated garbage or whatever. Whatever people build nowadays. Um, when you're doing, like, excavating the foundation for something like that, you know, you... And there might be fossils there. You need somebody on site to oversee things. So that's called paleo monitoring, or sometimes paleontological remediation, or something like that. And there are a lot of, especially younger paleontologists who make their living doing that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anywho, let's, uh, let's get our glue together. We'll start putting this thing. this thing together. Yeah. Let me grab the glue. this take to print uh this was 110 hours of total print time the moon does exist and thank you craigery for the follow welcome to paleontologizing good to have you here yeah 110 hours um so yeah the allosaurus took about nine times longer because it's a much larger skull and it had many more pieces Yeah, I'm going to be working on some other large dinosaur skulls in the coming weeks and months. Um, I've got a very large Stegosaurus skull. I've got a life-size um, Irritator skull, big Spinosaurid. And then I might be doing a Gallimimus skull as well. Maybe another baby T-Rex and another baby Triceratops. We shall see. Here, I'm going to smush some of this glue together. Do kind of a test fitting here. Before we kind of finalize things with our cyanoacrylate, our super glue. Yeah, that's looking good. We're getting some nice fits. There we go. So there's... This can be a little bit deceptive. There are certain parts that will be flush and certain parts that will not be flush. And so I've got to pay extra close attention because it's more complicated than it looks. For instance, this right here is not flush, these two, and they're not supposed to be. Whoops. Um, because of the way that I sliced this... Uh, there will be certain pieces that 
yeah, there are certain surfaces that need to be nice and smooth, and other ones that are not going to be flush. Ah, that's just the way this is set up. Okay, so there's my Gorilla Glue on there, and now we put on some super glue to seal the deal. There we go. Durder. There we are. Excellent. Yeah, nice. Very nice. Blue is cheap. Good stuff. All right. I feel really good about that. That's looking nice. Dirt or... so, there we are. Like I said, these parts here are not going to be flush. Um, but these parts are. So what you're looking at here, that is the Neris. Or rather the Nares. They're combined into one. But the nostrils... Uh, the bony nostrils are there at the top of the head on Diplodocus. And, uh... In a lot of these sauropod dinosaurs, that's the case. Their fleshy nostrils were not that high up in life. They would have been down toward the end of the snout. But it would have been kind of a fleshy tube that would have, uh... Would have extended down there like that. So even though the bony nostrils are here, like, up in the top of the forehead or rather up here, like in between the eyes, it, the, bo the the actual nostrils that the animal used for breathing and smelling and everything were down toward the tip of the snout. There was like a fleshy tube that went there. So anyway, the bony nostrils are a little bit deceptive in that regard, if that makes sense. All right, looking good, looking good. Let's see if we can do our... Maxillin, no? There we go. This on here, just like that. Oh, that's a lovely fit. Excellent. And I'm glad I took the time to uh, do all of the sanding before stream today, so I didn't have to do that live. Yeah. Uh... Very nice. Yeah. Change the category to makers and crafting? Yeah, go for it, Claire. That sounds good, actually. Thanks for asking. I think that's a fine idea. So that goes all the way to there. Okay. Whoop, oh, wrong button. Take some more of our slow cure gorilla glue once I find it. Here it is. And we'll put that on here. Yeah. Um, I gotta make sure I'm not applying too much glue since, again, these don't. So we'll start right there. I don't want to put it on this surface right here because this is going to be exposed for a while. We're just trying to stick these pieces together. I'm not going to put glue over this entire flat surface because the piece that I'm putting on is not going to cover this entire flat surface. And I don't want to waste any glue and have to like chip it off later. You know what I mean? But in the serious game of paleontology, much larger mysteries still remain. And, uh, Vegan Carrots, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Anywho. I feel like I need a Diplodocus song, says HD. 
You know, there might be one. Give me a second here. I don't I can't guarantee it's gonna be any good. But uh I don't know if there is a Diplodocus, so let me try this. Uh, apparently there's one from something called Pink Fong? Huh. I apologize if this is going to torture anybody, but let's let's take a look. Search for Ping Fong on YouTube. Yeah, maybe don't. The super duper dinosaur Diplodocus. Huh. My strong legs stop and he stop stop. Okay. The super duper dinosaur Diplodocus. So it's it's kind of a. It's kind of like Battle Hymn of the Republic. Whip my long tail, whippity whip whip. Everyone they do actually talk about the long whip like tail, which is a legit thing. A super duper dinosaur diplodocus. Okay. There you go. Mercifully short. <laughs> uh yeah. All right, I can use a little bit more glue on here. And that certainly was a thing, Ariana Celestine, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it does go to show that Diplodocus is a very popular dinosaur, especially overseas. In the UK especially, Diplodocus is still one of the most well-known dinosaurs to the general public. Um, Dippy the Diplodocus is arguably the most famous dinosaur, like, individual dinosaur in the whole of the UK. And that goes back to Andrew Carnegie. It goes back to, what was it, 1908 or something? So that legacy continues. Um, Dippy recently went on tour um, of various museums throughout the UK. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. So it's really cool that what we're putting together here is really a, a piece of dinosaur science history here. Um, this is an iconic specimen. And I'm going to be... Well, I'm really excited to have this here in my office. I am stoked. All right, check that out. She's coming together. There's that iconic silhouette. Oh boy. Yeah. There we go. Very nice. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. And uh, what's next? Start doing the back of the skull over here. Like that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Apply some blue here. And you expected Dippy to have a theme song? You know, I would not be shocked if there's like songs that have been written for school children in the UK about Dippy the Diplodocus. I would not be surprised. All right, it's gonna go on there like that. And thank you, thank you, the Southpaw, for the Prime sub. I really appreciate that. 
Let's protect our fossils because good stuff. If they're removed, America loses them forever. Thank you, Southpaw. Appreciate you. Are you left-handed? It's good to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. There. Excellent. All right. Uh, I think your content is super unique for this platform. And yes, I am a lefty. Well, Southpaw, thank you for subscribing and for saying hello for the first time. Welcome, welcome. I'm always, I'm always tickled when. A long-time lurker decides to chime in for the first time. Appreciate you. And I'm glad you've been enjoying things. Um, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Alright. So, super glue on here. I'm going to have to buy some more glue after this. Or put some on the wish list. Um, for uh, anybody who wants to be extra generous an opportunity to contribute to our work here. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Lovely. Oh, that is working really nicely. I'm excited with how well this is coming together. Yeah, nice. Very good. Very good. Check that out so far. <laughs> She's coming together. Oh, boy. Yeah. Excellent. Holy cow. Yeah. Whoop. Wrong buttons. There we go. Uh, so Tech says that's huge. Not nearly done yet either. Right, let's do the other back quadrant of the skull like this. We've got a whole bunch of different skull bones that are all back here in this area. You've got your occipital condyle. You've got your quadrate, your articular, all kinds of stuff. Not articular. Anyway. All kinds of exciting stuff back here. Um, oh man, and it's so nice just when those pieces slot together like that, just the way they should. Ah! Oh, it makes me happy. This is going quicker than I thought it was, too. Now, this is not going to be absolutely 100% assembled because I did have some issues with the 3D printer running out of filament and stuff. And so there are a few blank spots that I'm going to have to fill in with water putty later on. And you'll see. You'll see how that works in a bit. Um, I'll be doing that off stream, filling in the gaps. But we'll be, you know, 95% completed today in terms of assembly. on there just like that. Very nice. Excellent. That is beautiful. Yeah. Good stuff. Alright. Let's get some super glue on there now that that's nice and tamped down. Look at that. 
Ah, yes. We've got the back of our skull now assembled. Check that out. Lovely. Yeah. Uh... Oh man. Beautiful. Okay. Now let's do our got a cheek down over here. Our jugal bones. A few other pieces are gonna go right there. So it should fit on just like that. Lovely. And then we'll just have our snoot. It's our upper and lower jaws at the teeth. That is going to be excellent. And it turns out I forgot to sand this part down. So I might bring the... Oh. I have sandpaper right here. Let's just do that real quick. Just scuff it up a little bit so that the... Uh... So the glue adheres well. If the surface is too smooth then the glue is not going to do as good a job. So I'm just adding some texture here, roughing this up. There we go. Good enough. Okay. And I'm being real generous with this Gorilla Glue. Because I find that works really well in this kind of a situation. And it's therefore likely that we're here today because, by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. Thank you, thank you. To uh, Lestat Creations. It may be something that's never been seen before. Um, Lestat Creations, thank you so much for the 11 months of support. I really appreciate that. And King Louis the Seventh, thank you for the follow. Good to have you. Yeah. There we are. Looking good. Put that on here. Oh, superb. I just love that feeling when a dinosaur comes together. When it's assembled and... Just be like, yep, that's a dinosaur. <laughs> uh... Very nice. Okay. Super glue on there. There we are. Lovely. Oh, that is excellent. So we've got everything on here now, except for the end of the snout. Check that out. <laughs> Beautiful. We will have a gap right here because this is where I ran out of filament. But I'll be able to fill that in with some water putty. Uh, oh, and this down here, too. Ran out of filament there also. Um, this used a lot of filament, as you can imagine. And shoot, another way to help support these broadcasts is... Uh, well, we've got more filament on the Amazon wish list, if you're feeling super generous. Uh, you can help that 3D printer keep on humming by buying some more filament, if you'd like. If you'd like to see more cool things like this get printed, I've got a number of other dinosaur skulls that I'm really excited to print, but I gotta get more filament first. Um, yeah. Let's do our 
upper jaw here with our teeth. Check that out. Those pencil-like teeth there at the front. Nice. Boy, and I'm going to stand up for this, actually. There. There we go. Let's go on here just like this. Nice. Okay. Okay. We don't have perfect occlusion, but that's okay. I got a water putty it anyway with that missing piece. Super glue on there. There we go. Lovely. <laughs> All right, we've got some nice occlusion there on the surfaces that matter. I'm getting some super glue on my fingers, but that's okay. Very nice. And I'm going to kind of hold this in place for a while just to make sure that it really starts to set. HD says, after watching you in the desert, I feel like you should be doing this kind of work kneeling on the floor. I 100% would be doing that if I were not streaming right now. I can tell you. That's, you know, anytime I'm working on 3D prints otherwise, when I'm not on stream, I'm usually on my knees on the floor. Because it's just a comfortable kind of position for me to work in. Probably because I do so much field work like that. Uh... And David Peterson, well, well, well. Thank you for the raid. Um, hello. David Peterson, David Peterson, how are you doing? It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as you can see, I'm assembling a life-size 3D printed Diplodocus skull right now. The skull of Dippy, uh, one of the world's most famous dinosaurs. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Here, to provide you a little bit of background on this, I'll pull up a video um, while some of this glue sets. Uh, but how was your stream, David Peterson? I hope it was really good. For anybody not yet following David Peterson, if you've ever heard of the book series Mouse Guard, he is the creator of Mouse Guard. He streams here on Twitch. Really cool channel. Check him out. Uh, there we go. Uh, And so this is reassembling Dippy while she was on tour. This is like a time lapse. And but that's not really what I was looking for. 
Um, try this. I should get by today. Is there not going to be people talking here? Is it just copyrighted music? Oh boy. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Today we're in this amazing warehouse where Dippy's being stored just for a week or two before we go down to Dorset and install. Oh, I recognize her. There's photos of her holding the skull. I can't believe it was almost a year ago that we took Dippy down from Hinsey Hall. And since that time, Dippy's been in Canada and had a new armature made and we're really excited because it's just come back to the UK now. Why Canada? Has anybody got any idea? Hmm, why do you think it might be uh, Canada? That Dippy paid a visit to? Hmm. All right, you have a lovely night you as well, Volcano Duck. Thank you, thank you for being here. And good luck with the classes starting this week, you said? Holy cow, that's early. I hope it goes well. Um, Canada because it's cold? Not because they asked politely, no. The reason why Dippy went all the way to Canada from the UK is because of, uh... Well, shoot. Mm -hmm. We were looking at this at the beginning of the stream. There we go. Research Casting International, which is arguably the world's greatest institution <laughs> for, uh, for building dinosaurs, for mounting fossil skeletons. It's there in Canada. Yeah. Uh, um, here, there might even be a specific video about that. Um... Let's see here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if if they made a special video about Dippy there, but yeah. Here's the original Dippy at the Carnegie. With Diplodocus carnegii, the dinosaur yeah. we affectionately refer to as Dippy, our beloved mascot. But do you know this fossil's origin story? Dippy's journey to the museum begins with a newspaper article in late 1898 that claimed most colossal animal ever on Earth just found out west. This news quickly caught the attention of museum founder Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie asked the museum's director, Dr. William Holland, to get a dinosaur for Pittsburgh. And so a team of paleontologists traveled to Wyoming. In early July, 1899, after a few months of searching for fossils in several locations, the team finally uncovered some very impressive bones at Sheep Creek, Wyoming. Sheep Creek, see, I told you. So big and so many that they filled 130 crates, an entire box car when they were sent back to Pittsburgh. Carnegie Museum paleontologists freed these fascinating fossils from the surrounding rock and discovered a new species of dinosaur, naming it Diplodocus carnegii. A new wing of the museum was built to display this 85 foot long specimen. So excited was the world about this fossil that King Edward VII asked Andrew Carnegie for a dinosaur for England. Yep. A cast or replica of Dippy was made under Carnegie Museum scientist supervision, shipped to England and put on display in London's British Museum of Natural History. And it wasn't the only one. Eventually, nine more replicas of Dippy were made and sent to places all over the world, including Berlin, Madrid, Paris, and Mexico City. It's yep. so exciting that Dippy can be seen all over the world, but only here in Dinosaurs in Their Time in Carnegie Museum of Natural History can anyone see the real thing. Pretty cool. Yeah. But Dippy is arguably more famous 
in the UK. Which are made, and we're really excited. A lot more famous, to actually. Come back to the UK now, and yeah. so what we're doing here today is we're looking into all of the crates where the parts of Dippy are, and we're just checking over the condition so that we can make sure we don't have any issues that we're unaware of. Yes, skull. Maybe, wow. maybe. It looks like it now. There's a skull in there. You see that? <laughs> It's not a major thing, but it's probably just a little bit of um, stress when it was packed in. So these are made of plaster. So this this really kind of warms my heart here. Shoot, this skull is so big on my desk. Um, this warms my heart in the sense that such enthusiasm for a dinosaur and not even an original dinosaur fossil, a plaster cast replica. Um, I know it's a historical specimen in that sense, but man, do people in the UK love their plaster cast of our American dinosaur, you know? Um, I just find it really funny, you know? Like, it's literally made of plaster. Um, but still, it's... it's of historical importance. It's cool forces on it, so it's very minor. This is interesting. That was all in a box before, wasn't it? Yeah. We've checked all of the crates that have actually got parts of the skeleton in. Conditions are mainly okay. There's one or two things that we need to deal with, but we can build that into the planning when we do the install now. So we're going to be putting the crates back together and then down to Dorset. Hmm. And yeah, I definitely need more fill of it. I want to do the full skeleton there. The South Bar and snapping the runs. Jurassic Coast. Yeah. And Dorchester County Museum have been so helpful and friendly. So we think Dorchester is a fitting start to this amazing journey for Diffie. <laughs> it's a large 25 metre long skeleton. Some parts are very heavy. And the venue here, like some of the other venues we're going to be installing Diffie in, you know, has its own unique set of challenges. Oh. And there you go, HD, yes. <laughs> But Dippy is quite large in this space, and we have to really consider what we're doing. Heavy lifting equipment, making sure every piece is checked over, that we've got all of the pieces, and that we're putting them on in the right order. There's lots yeah, of don't, things Yeah, don't lose about. any of the pieces. It's a bit like a giant heavy Meccano set. So you start with the back legs and then you put the pelvis on and then the challenge comes when you put all the vertebra on that join the pelvis to the front legs. You have to almost do that in one, so one piece is needed for the next piece to happen. Very cool. Yeah, and uh, oh, from Mareki, thank you, Claire Burr, for reposting that. Uh, regarding gluing and crafting, what do you think about the current methods of preserving and safeguarding fossils for future generations? As a layperson, I've always been curious. Are the current technologies sufficient and capable of adequately protecting museum exhibits? In my experience, yes. So, back uh, when Dippy was first excavated and cast and everything, um, the methods and, and techniques that we had were a lot more primitive than today when you're trying like a lot of fossils were excavated in the field without really the the use of preservatives or anything like that nowadays when we're gluing a when we're digging up a dinosaur we're constantly gluing it at the same time so we're using reversible polyvinyl acetate glue during the excavation process to help keep the fossils from disintegrating back in the day you had to mostly hope that you know it's well preserved enough that it's not going to crumble as you're getting it out of the ground. And then if they did use glues, they were stuff like shellac, which uh, it's nasty stuff and it's often permanent. The glues that we use now are, like I said, reversible, which means that if you put them on, you can take them off too. Um, so like the PVA glue that I was using in the field this summer is reversible through the use of acetone. Since it is an acetone and plastic-based glue, you can use more acetone to just dissolve the glue away and undo it if you need to. Reversibility is a huge deal in, uh, in the museum field, just because like anything that you're gonna do to a specimen, a fossil, an artifact, whatever, you need to be able to undo it too. 
that's kind of the credo of one of the credos of museum science like that is reversibility hope that makes sense yeah anywho uh good question there uh uh Mirek. yeah I'm gonna put the lower jaw on here too. There's the skull. Yeah. So ours, of course, is a 3D print, and it's actually scanned from that model right there. So that's the thing. That's where I got those files from. I can, uh... Oh, that's not it. I can show you the exactly where I got the file from. Here it is. Yeah. Wait, no, this is the whole skeleton. That's not what I was looking for. Well, there's the whole skeleton at the NHM, all scanned. And so, yeah, if I had enough filament, I guess I could print the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but that's not what I was looking for. I'm looking for the skull. Hmm. And that's the one in Vienna, actually, that skeleton that you were saying there. Uh, here. Aquatica skull. There we are. Yeah. So this is where I downloaded it from. It's a free download from the Natural History Museum in London. And, uh, yeah, when you get the file and up, you know, open it up in your 3D printing or 3D printing slicing software, it automatically makes it life size. So that's the default. You can scale it up or scale it down. I just left it as is to get it life size there. And here's the link in the chat for you. Good stuff. Generic spinoff says, how was it scanned? Uh, oftentimes, they'll give you details on a page like this. Uh, 3D skull model was created by laser scanning the museum's iconic Diplodocus Carnegie cast. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Dippy was the first Diplodocus to go on display anywhere in the world when it was gifted to the museum in 1905. That's true. Again, the, the London cast of Dippy went on display before the actual bones did in Pittsburgh. Uh, mounting the actual skeleton took longer than producing a cast, shipping it overseas, and unveiling it. Uh, not surprising, I guess, when you realize that mounting the actual dinosaur fossils, the bones themselves takes a tremendous amount of work. It's really expensive, really time-consuming. It's often much cheaper just to produce a replica like that and put that up on display. Anyway, uh, Dibu Kuga became a star, capturing hearts and imaginations. She then left the museum in 2017 to complete a whirlwind tour of the UK. The skeleton will be on display at the museum from 27th of May until the 2nd of January, 2023. Uh, to mark the event, we've prepared a set of 3D printable files, which should be downloaded and pr printed on a conventional desktop 3D printer assembled to create a three-quarter scale model of the skull or a model which can be completed uh compiled from laser cut sections of cardboard um yeah the one that i have is not three to quarter scale it's life size i'm not sure why they said that but anyway maybe that's there's another one for downloading yeah um anyway good stuff yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Anywho. Check her out. She's got an extreme overbite right there because she doesn't have the lower jaw put on yet. That's 
Let's do that. Let's put that lower jaw on, shall we? There we go. Find a way to... There, okay. That can sit like that. Good. Excellent. There's our lower jaw. Okay. We go on just like this. Lovely. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to have to hold this in place in order to get it to... Because it's kind of bowing inward a little bit. So yeah, this is definitely going to require some finagling here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a video going in order to keep this interesting. I'm going to put a video going in the meantime. Um, about Dippy the Diplodocus. Let's see here. There we go. Dippy is one of the most iconic specimens in our entire collection. And Dippy has been delighting visitors here in London for well over a hundred years. But we wanted visitors from outside London to be inspired by Dippy. And that's why we launched our most ambitious national program ever. The Garfield yeah, Western Foundation has been supporting charities since 1958, and since ago, then has made donations of over £1.2 billion. Pounds. Our trustees supported Dippy on Tour to inspire people across the country to rediscover our natural world. We are delighted that the impact of Dippy has been so positive across the country and has been seen by so many people. Very cool. It's been to eight venues across the UK. And in each location, the teams there have worked to bring together the local collections, the local wildlife, and to work with local partners to inspire people in their local communities. This has been a monumental collaboration with teams yeah. from the Natural History Museum and our partners. And this programme has smashed all expectations. Dippy has now inspired over five million people. Very cool. What's really funny is, again, this is just a cast. Like, it's a plaster replica of the original, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But the idea that a cast can be that inspiring to people um, it is just a... Uh, such a brilliant feeling. It's been great working with the National History Museum for the last two and a half years. The last fortnight working with the team... It just shows how spellbinding dinosaurs are, do you know? The whole city of Birmingham's really got behind um, Dippy. So we've had many partners. So, um, for example, the re retail Birmingham Improvement District created go, real. a trail of 10 <laughs> topiary dinosaurs to really kind of join in on the fun. Oh, uh, that's fun. Learning activities. Those are pretty well done, actually. Yeah. Had Cadbury World get on board, creating a large chocolate dinosaur egg. Um, and Paradise <laughs> Birmingham, a development site just across from us, have sponsored the exhibition as well. The jaws coming together. I'm happy with this. Seeing pictures of kids coming through on social media out with little bug catchers that were selling downstairs in, in the shop, actually out there exploring nature. That's what the whole thing is about. They've come in, seen Debbie, been inspired <laughs> to go out and explore, and they're out there doing it. Six, over 600,000 people, that's amazing. Just Very cool. Reach. So we had visitors coming from various other parts of Scotland, from the likes of Aberdeen, from Elgin, uh, and, and the more local ones from Paisley and Lanarkshire. So I think um, it was this, the scale of Dippy and the fact that he brought people in 
from so far away it gave us a real chance to put Kelvin Grove all over the Scottish map, if you like. <laughs> That's a beautiful venue, holy cow. The important thing for the Great North yeah. Museum is we have a one team ethos and actually this project touched our teams at every level. Because of that, we get that shared sense of pride in welcoming Dippy here. It's really pulled the team together. We've had a lot of fun with him and we're excited by people's reactions to him. Wait, her? She's a she, Dippy's a she. Traditionally, she's called a she. The most common response is they come in the front door and they go, wow, because he's so big and he takes up so much space and you can see all of him at once. And it is as you come in. It's a she. And I really do think that. Um, oh, that boy. Wonder on uh, children's faces <laughs> when they see him is, is one of the main things. The best thing about having Dippy in Rochdale was the fact that Dippy came to Rochdale, one of the most disadvantaged boroughs in England, and it really has helped inspire those communities who would never have dreamt of having this experience. We had a roadshow which went to schools and community groups. Whilst Dippy was here, we had learning resources which were able to be used in school and out of school and during the visit. And you just had to see the effect when families and school children and young people came to the exhibition, visited Dippy and interacted with all the interactives. There's no doubt that in there, there's some scientists of the future. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Over 6,000 young people and children visited Dippy and Norwich Cathedral. I miss Dippy because he's kind of felt, he feels like a friend. He feels like he belongs in this space. And <laughs> I'll miss the interaction of people just coming in, that sense of excitement, the buzz in the queue. I just love all of that. And our hope is that there will be long term benefits from having had Dippy here, and that although Dippy will have gone, lots of the benefits will remain. Pretty cool, pretty cool. More dinosaurs in churches. There you go, Claire Burr, yeah. Squiggles de Gabo says, I'd like to say a huge thank you. Uh, egg laying animals have different hip structures. I understand it. So theoretically, we can know if we have hip bones. Oh, were you talking about for trying to sex the dinosaur, figure out if it was male or female? It doesn't work that way. No. Um, that's been tested to like look at modern birds and their pelvic apertures. Because the idea is that maybe, like, female birds would have larger pelvic apertures because the eggs have to pass through. Turns out that's not the case. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> um, the only way that we can tell if a dinosaur was male or female at this point is to, uh, to look for medullary bone. So we can only tell if they were male or female if you cut open the bone and you find medullary bone inside, which is something that female egg-laying animals produce as they're about to lay their eggs so you can only tell if basically you can only ever identify a pregnant female dinosaur a gravid female dinosaur and apart from that you can't ever tell if a dinosaur is male or female so far you know nobody's ever been able to devise a method that works apart from that and even that has got some some doubters um my undergrad advisor isn't necessarily convinced that that actually is real medullary bone so he thinks even that might be doubtful, but yeah, so only if they died exactly, Squiggles, yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah. Anywho. We've got this assembled now. Would you like to see? Would you like to see Dippy and all her glory now? Here 
we go. Check that out. I am very excited about this. Holy cow, there's still a few gaps to fill in, like this right here. And then this right here where I'd run out of filament. But I can fill that in with some water putty. And then I'll also be filling in all of the seams between different pieces like this. And then getting it smoothed and painted. But this is going to be a lovely addition to our office here. And I look forward to being able to put Dippy Skull up on display in our, uh, in our background up here. That's going to be excellent. I cannot wait. Holy cow. Look at that. And everybody who was saying, oh, it looks like it's only three-quarter size. Let me show you uh, an image. I'm pretty darn certain that we've got the full-size one here. Because here is a picture of somebody on the museum staff holding that skull. And here's me holding the skull. But presumably I'm taller than she is. But yeah, it is, uh, it's pretty big. I've also seen this in person. I've seen life-size casts of Dippy's skull in person. Saw one, even photographed it uh, last summer in Utah. Uh, if any of you happen to be in Utah or anywhere within easy driving distance of Price, Utah, I would highly recommend you pay a visit to the Prehistoric Museum. Uh, in price, because they have a brilliant Dippy temporary exhibit there. Uh, with a plaster cast of Dippy on display. Not a mounted skeleton, but you get to go up and see all of the individual bones like this. Uh, there we go. Hang on a sec. Where's her skull? There we go. Um, and some excellent signage there. Really, really well-written placards. Yeah. Vernal, Utah. That is a lovely picture, too. Oh, man. I turned that into a Christmas card. Uh, but I was there while they were still installing this exhibit, still putting everything together. I was there for a conference, the Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference, um, last June. Yeah. And there is her skull right there. Yeah, it's funny, the, the cast that I have is arguably higher quality than this, more detailed. But yeah, that does not look one-fourth bigger than the one that I have here. So I can be pretty certain that what we've got is uh, full size. Yeah, pretty cool. Spiffiness is that one has an underbite. It's just the way that the, the skull is sitting, where they've got the lower jaw a little bit forward. Because the upper and lower jaw in this one are not connected. And so it's just kind of sitting like that with a bit of an underbite. Yeah. Anywho, yeah. Um, and you can see Dippy all over the world in different places. There she is in... Is that the original one? Diplodic is seen around the world. There's the unveiling in London. Uh, this is the original skeleton in Pittsburgh. There we go. Mexico City right there. There we go. Vernal, Utah. Uh, 
And then St. Petersburg. Yeah, it this one is... It's got a weird pose to it. Um, Russian scientists are like, well, it's a reptile, so it should have sprawling limbs, and they really kind of messed it up. Yeah, there's the one in La Plata, Argentina. Much more... Posed in a much more modern way. And then here's the original in Pittsburgh after a renovation. No longer dragging her tail on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Anywho. Pretty excited to have my very own Dippy Skull here now. Uh, this is something that... I've seen images of this since I was a little kid. You know? Classic dinosaur iconography. The skull of Diplodocus Carnegie, and uh, now I've got it here in the office. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Uh, Spiffy says, what and how did it eat with teeth or jaws like that? Great question. Let me see if I can find you a clip. We've got every reason to think that these guys would have been kind of ground level browsers or grazers. Grazer is probably closer uh, to what these guys were doing. So they're eating plants basically at ground level. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is from Walking with Dinosaurs from 1999. That's Diplodocus right there. Yeah. So see how they kind of hold their head and neck out horizontal from the body? Anyway, I'm trying to find you a particular clip with some young Diplodocus who are using their teeth to do their thing. Um, there we go. Uh, so these are little young Diplodocus. Oh, an interesting diagonal. Huh. Here we go. There you go. Um... Yeah. So let's see that again. So those peg-like or pencil-like teeth may have been perfect for chomping down on ferns and maybe even for just like stripping the leaves off of ferns like this. Yeah. It's... An interesting idea, and I remember talking with Kerry Woodruff about this, who's a specialist on sauropods, um, and he's like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. These guys seem to have been what we call sweep feeders, so kind of standing in one place and sweeping their really long neck in a wide arc like that to be able to feed really efficiently. If you can just stand in one place and not have to exert energy walking around, moving this gigantic body of yours all over the place, if you can just stand with your feet planted, and eat all of the ground cover plants within a wide arc like that. Then you take a couple steps and you do the whole thing again. It's a really efficient way of, of feeding. So these guys weren't chewers. They were just using those peg-like teeth to kind of crop 
low-growing vegetation like this. And maybe it was stripping ferns of their leaves. I'm sure you could test this by doing, like, microware analysis on the teeth. Uh, for that kind of... For that kind of motion that you see here. You know, like, stripping leaves off like that. You would think you would get wear along the, the sides of the individual teeth. And you'd hopefully be able to see that if you look at them really closely, if you're studying micro wear on the teeth. Uh, but I don't know if anybody's actually tested that hypothesis yet. Um, in fact, shoot, I think that would be really cool. Maybe I'll add that to my long list of project ideas. Yeah. Anyhow, good stuff. Um, and Diagonal says, folks, do not eat modern ferns. Many contain chemicals that are toxic or that destroy vitamins. There you go, Diagonal. Good advice. I know that might, you know, this might seem super tasty. Uh, doing this? Your teeth are not built for that, nor is your digestive system built for that. Yeah. Humans are not exactly clever. We did not evolve to eat ferns. Yes. The Zune says the forbidden salad. There you go. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Yeah. And... But yeah. And not horsetails. They may have eaten horsetails, too. Here, let's go to... Uh... Where Carrie talks about sauropods. So, even though sauropods are the largest animals that have ever. Pause. Let's do this so slow like that sometimes. Um. Here we go. So, I'm actually. I did one of the illustrations for one of Carrie's papers here. A long term long time viewers already know what this is all about, but for anybody new, this is really cool. Trying to like figure out why in the world do these animals have such long necks, such tiny heads? Why do they only have teeth at the front of their jaws right here? You know, like this. What's going on with them? And why do they have these weird structures on their vertebrae? Here we go. But ligaments. But during this whole project there was something that was deeply troubling me. And that was Thompson's sauropod suspension bridge model. And the big reason that this was troubling me, and it'd been so popular for time immemorial, uh -huh. but the big issue is a bridge is meant for static forces, right? A bridge is meant to be I've stable. I've got some and super glue on my over. fingers. I'm going to use some lotion. Generally speaking, if you have a moving bridge, that. there is right a back. problem. So I kept figuring that the sauropod suspension bridge, while superficially there were elements of it that certainly I think are uh, suitable and analogous, it's not a really good model for the sauropod bow plan. And I kept thinking about this and it kept troubling me. And I was driving along with my ex-wife one day to go visit her grandparents. It's a great story. And I was thinking about this. We were driving in Montana and I happened to look off in a field and I see a thing out in this field that I've seen a thousand times before in a field. But I realized there in the moment that was my Newton's apple that here I was looking at something that was a, what I thought was a perfect mechanical analog to a sauropod. Hmm. I was so captivated with it that I, in fact, drove off the road, much to my ex-wife's dismay. And she couldn't understand why I was jumping out of the car and taking pictures of... What do you think he was taking pictures of, chat? What do you think it was? What was Carrie Woodruff's Newton's apple moment? A cow? An excavator? An oil pump? Batman? No. Not a dead dinosaur on the road. Uh-uh. No. Not a bridge. Not high tension wires, but that's a great guess, Anastasia. The curvature asks Moo Hoodles. How are you doing, Moo? Good to see ya. Not that. Hmm. A central pivot irrigator. There you go. So those of you yeah. who may not be familiar with central pivot irrigators, you know, they're a very popular irrigation system here in the West. 
if you've ever been flying and you wonder what all those circles are, it's because <laughs> of these pivot irrigators. Yeah, in fact, actually, I always do this when we talk about this, but um, let's see. Oh, hello, sweetie pie. How are you doing? Here. Mm hmm. Uh, there we go. Now, in a moment, we'll be raffling off our grand prize a ride on the famous Duff Beer Blimp. A ride <laughs> on the Duff Blimp. You see the circular pattern on those fields? That's from Central Pivot Irrigation. Wow. Now let's see what's happening with the Super <laughs> Central Pivot Irrigation. See? Oops. Sorry. Homer! 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 Anyway, um, Central Piv Pivot Irrigation. Uh, and I would be petting Sweetie Pie right now, but I just... From prehistoric time. I just put a bunch of lotion on my hands to help get rid of this super glue, so Sweetie Pie's gonna have to wait for a minute here. But let's get her on the cat cam. You want some more treats, Sweetie Pie? Mo uh, Mini Pie left a couple there for you to eat, but let me get you some more, huh? Yeah. There we go. Here's the good stuff. You know what it is. There you go. Four, three, four, five. How's that? Good stuff? What are you looking over there for? Nobody's gonna get ya. Jessica says she sees us, chat. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, uh, central pivot irrigation. Circular pattern on those fields. That's from central pivot irrigation. Wow. Now let's. So. That's right here. Wonder what all those circles are? It's because of these pivot irrigators, and a lot of pyramid pivot irrigators, the way they're designed is they have this long horizontally extended piece, that's the sprayer, yep. and then they have these V-shaped brackets that run along the top, and a left and right cable that's suspended between these V-shaped brackets. And they are, in fact, when the central pivot irrigator was actually introduced to the world in the 1976 issue of Science Magazine, it was hailed and purposely designed that way for dealing with stresses as it moves left and right in a field. Yep. So I argue that the central pivot irrigator is a much more better mechanical analog to certain sauropods. Makes a lot of sense. But the whole key to this, what I think is the sort of the linchpin, the success story of this is that split I'll see ligament. you later, Speedy Pie. <laughs> now, a lot of animals take advantage of ligaments today, right? Anywho, yeah, so we've got uh, stretchy ligaments like that. Here's a figure that I actually helped carry put together. Um, he was still kind of like learning how to do a lot of stuff in Photoshop at the time. But here's the idea is you've got these big nuchal ligaments coming off of those uh, bifurcated neural spines on the neck vertebrae. Uh, blue is the right side, green is the left side. And so you just contract that nuchal ligament just a little bit. And that helps the whole neck swing to that side. Um, it's a very efficient way of doing that. It doesn't require a lot of energy. And so this is the essence of sweep feeding and sauropods like this. Like our, uh, our Diplodocus that we just finished assembling. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Electro says, so what you're saying is the guy who invented the irrigator stole the idea from the dinosaurs? I think the dinosaurs have the case to sue. Well, shoot. If the diplodocid dinosaurs like 
Diplodocus here hadn't gone extinct. Actually, no, this is probably a Patasaurus. But if they hadn't gone extinct 140 million years ago, probably like 144 million years ago, then, uh, yeah, then maybe they would have a decent case. I wonder who controls their estate now. I guess it's the birds, huh? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Anyway, Kesta tosses the air was lighter. That's not actually the case if you're talking about like atmospheric composition being significantly different during the age of dinosaurs. It really wasn't. Yeah. If anything, there was throughout certain parts of the age of dinosaurs less oxygen in the atmosphere than there is today. Yeah. And did the tail swing opposite the neck? They're not really connected like that, HD, no. I mean, they're both part of the vertebral column, part of the axial skeleton, but they serve different purposes. So the tail is a counterbalance to the long neck, and the tail also was a big anchor for these huge leg muscles. The caudofemoralis muscle in particular. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Here it is on T-Rex, but it, it runs from that big trochanter on the femur, that bump on the back of the femur, to each of the transverse processes on the caudal vertebrae. So here's a cross section right there of one of the tail vertebrae, and you've got these transverse processes that stick out to the sides. Those are anchor points for that huge caudal femoralis muscle. So the way that the tail would work in dinosaurs is as they're walking, you've got this huge beefy muscle in the tail on either side of the tail right there and those uh like those muscles help with the backswing of the femur so as the dinosaur is walking um there's like yeah there's this huge muscle that's helping them swim swing the thigh bone back a dinosaur j-a-x-c-a -A. how are you doing welcome to paleontologizing thank you for the follow so yeah yeah. But yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rexy got glutes. Yeah, there you go, Squiggles. Absolutely. Um, this is from Scott Hartman's skeletal drawing website. T-Rex Baby Got Back. This article is entitled. Uh. Um, so this is what it looks like in an alligator. You've got those caudofemoralis muscles. Yeah. The red muscle is the caudofemoralis. It starts out fairly small, but as it gets closer to the base of the tail, it expands greatly, pushing the other muscles in the tail out of the way in the process. As it enters the leg, uh, below most of the leg muscles, it joins another head of the caudofemoralis, yes, in the yellow, that actually originates from a shelf on the upper hip bone. That's the ilium up there. Yeah, uh, this model of a tail probably, this model of tail muscles probably applies to almost any dinosaur that doesn't have an absurdly reduced tail, like birds, for instance. And the greater amount of muscle would better power dinosaurs into those gee whiz activities people like to draw them in. So I guess my advice to paleo artists in this case is cover your butt. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, and uh. Oh, here, I'll give you a link to this, by the way. There we go. But yeah, and Andre Bormalihe says, how do we know what color the skin was? For dinosaurs, you mean? Here, it might surprise you to learn. Oh, thank you, Dr. Electro. You gifted a tier one sub to drive underscore elector zero. This is their first gift sub in the channel. Dr. Electro, thank you for gifting Dr. Electro. I appreciate that. Um, I was going to say, it might surprise you to learn there, uh, Andre. We don't really know what Did color most dinosaurs go, were. Have a moment where it was kind of heartbreaking. I'm no. destroying it. I could do. No, blue is cheap. My pride was just prime. sitting there, so here you go. Thank you for all the great info and content. I appreciate you, Akundu. Thank you, thank you for that prime. Tasty, tasty prime. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. 
Especially if it was just sitting there. Thanks for putting it to good use on this channel and supporting science outreach here on Twitch. Appreciate that. Now, as I was saying uh, to uh, Andre, we don't know what colors most dinosaurs were. In fact, when I was a kid, that was almost a canard. It was a cliche. Like, oh, we'll never know what color dinosaurs were, so just take a wild guess. But over the past... Goodness, I guess like 15 years, we've actually started to figure it out for a few dinosaurs. And Zook, thank you. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. Three months of support at tier three, Zook. Thank you very much for that. Uh, wrong button. Anyway. Thank you for that. Tier 3 is a big deal, and I appreciate it very much, Zook. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support. Uh, yeah, here, let's see. We have been able to figure out colors for a few different dinosaurs, and it's because of preserved integument. So take a look at this. If we've got preserved skin or feathers, we can figure it out. Dinosaurs were was once thought impossible, but the discovery around a decade ago that some pigments can actually preserve in fossils has allowed us to reconstruct the likely color patterns of certain dinosaur species. Yep. One of the best places to find pigments preserved in dinosaurs is the early Cretaceous G-hole biota of China. Discovered here in the mid-1990s, Cynosteropteryx has feathers preserved that retain remnants of the original pigment that gave the animal Pretty its color. Cool. I'm going to grab some more lotion for it. This the means super that we can reconstruct its color patterns to give a better understanding of how it may have behaved and to tell us more about the environment in which it lived. One of the color patterns seen on Cynosteropteryx is that it had a dark back and a light underside. Yeah. This is a kind of camouflage called countershading. It works because in the daytime, sunlight comes from above, meaning that the top surface of an object is illuminated, while yep. the underside is shadowed. In seeing this, our brains are able to recognize things as three-dimensional objects. So this is something you might want to avoid if you're a predator or if you're prey. You don't want to just stand out. You know, you want to fade into the background as much as possible. It makes it that much easier to sneak up on prey or sneak away from predators. How do you do that? Well, many, many, many different animals have evolved a counter to this called counter shading. By making themselves dark on top and light underneath, they can help counteract that. In counter shaded animals, the top surface is darker and the lower surface is lighter. Yep. This evens out the effect of shadowing, so counter shaded animals appear less three dimensional, a would be benefit for both predators and prey. There you go. Importantly, yeah. lighting conditions vary between different types of habitat. And uh, Wild Bear says, bro, I love your dinosaur stuff and genuine passion. Makes me want to do my stuff well. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate the kind words. Um, Thank you. Genuinely. I appreciate that. Here. A moment from prehistoric time. And Phoenix117, thank you for the follow. Appreciate you. Welcome to Paleontologize. Uh, um, so this is cool that we can determine that a dinosaur like this had counter shading. But the particular pattern there, the ratio of like dark to light, can actually tell us something about what kind of environment it lived in. Here, less three dimensional. A would be benefit for both predators and prey. Here, check it out. Importantly, lighting conditions vary between different types of habitat. Mm -hmm. Animals living in open areas with lots of light tend to have a sharp, dark to light transition high up on the body, while animals living in closed areas, such as forests, there you go. tend to have more gradual transitions positioned lower down. Yep. This means that we could determine the likely habitat that Cynosteropteryx was living in 130 million years ago. Pretty cool. Science pattern of counter shading. Pretty darn cool. To determine in which environment the counter shading in Cynosteropteryx would have been most effective, 
we made three-dimensional models of its body and observed them under varying light conditions. This so this is just like, it's supposed to be a cross-section of a Sinusoraptorix torso right there. And they photograph it in a forest under, you know, foresty light conditions and then exactly out in the open where too. shadows would occur in each different habitat. Yep. We then compared that to the actual color patterns seen in the fossils. The counter shading transition was abrupt and high up on the body, best positioned to negate the shadows cast by direct yeah. sunlight. We can therefore infer that Sinusoroptrix was best suited to have lived in an open environment. <laughs> With this work, we have shown that by looking at paleocolor, we can start to understand important aspects of the behaviors of extinct animals. Pretty cool. Also, better interpret the long lost habitats and environments in which they lived. Pretty awesome stuff. Yeah. So not only have we been able to figure out what the color patterns of certain select dinosaurs were, dinosaurs that are extraordinarily well-preserved, where we actually have fossilized skin or feathers, and you've got preserved color cells in those skin or feathers, not only can we figure out what colors they were, but maybe figure something out about their lifestyle, what sort of habitat they're living in. It helps paint a picture of what these ancient ecosystems were like, no pun intended. But yeah, pretty neat. Um, and Mirek says, do we know how effective the esophageal muscles were for large herbivores in swallowing food? No. I mean, we don't have a good sense of that just based on... We don't have preserved muscles, really. And esophageal muscles, it's not like they're going to leave muscle scars on bones, I don't think. It's not like they're going to leave some sort of a trace on the neck vertebrae. I think those are just kind of there in the middle of the soft part of the neck. And so we don't have good fossil data on that, unfortunately. No. Anywho. Yeah. Uh, there's another... Oh, here, I'll give you a link to the video that we just watched. There we go. Dr. Hebb says those are smooth muscle, not skeletal muscle. Exactly. Yeah. Here. Oops, sorry, this is okay. going to be loud. We know a lot about dinosaurs, like how big they were, what they ate, even how quickly they moved. But there is one question that has plagued paleontologists for decades. What color were dinosaurs? Hmm. It might sound superficial, but trust me, it is not, because until we understand the coloration, we'll never be able to fully imagine dinosaurs. We won't know what they really looked like, of course, but we also won't be able to study things like camouflage or display behavior. And we will never know the full extent of just how wrong the Jurassic Park movies are. Thankfully, in recent years, a more complete picture of dinosaurs has come into focus and it is in technicolor. When you picture a dinosaur, mm. the colors that come to mind probably vary depending on how old you are. For much of the 20th century, for instance, dinosaurs were always yep. depicted in drab colors, gray, green, and brown. That's because back then, most experts thought that dinosaurs behaved like overgrown lizards, so they probably looked like that too. I mean, that's part of it, but also it's just the idea that when, we're, when we as human beings are used to thinking about large terrestrial animals, what are we used to thinking about? Well, big mammals. What's the biggest land animal that people think of? An elephant, you know? Elephants, rhinoceros, cape buffalo, hippopotamus. What do all these big mammals have in common? They're brown or gray or grayish brown or brownish gray. Um, most mammals are pretty drab in their coloration in part because most mammals are colorblind, essentially. They they can't see in color, so they're not going to evolve bright colors to, you know, communicate with their conspecifics or anything like that. They're, they're just going to be drab-colored, because that's how they see the world. Dinosaurs were not like that. Dinosaurs had full-color vision, just like their descendants, birds, do. And their cousins, crocodilians, also have full color vision as well, tetrachromatic vision. So crocodiles and birds can actually see more colors than we can as human beings. As we're descended from mammals, our our ancestors were largely colorblind during the age of dinosaurs, we think. So we as humans have only fairly recently re-evolved color vision. I'm not saying that humans re-evolved color vision, but our ancestors, primates, re-evolved color vision. And that's like... Uh, 
I don't know. They're trying to reclaim something that was lost through evolution a long time ago, and you know, you can't can't usually get everything back. So we only have trichromatic vision, not tetrachromatic vision. So anyway, dinosaurs are probably much more colorful than uh, than they're usually depicted, and recent fossil discoveries have borne that out. But yeah, and uh, yeah, Airbender Andy, you bet. Crocodilians also have tetrachromatic vision. Starting in the 1970s, dinos yeah. started to be portrayed as having things like spots and stripes and flashy colors, but not a lot of that was actually based on science. Then it came a major breakthrough from an unexpected place. It wasn't the dinosaur, but a fossil squid. Yeah, and helpful for fruit. That might be why uh, why color vision re-evolved in primates, Ken, yeah, is to you know, help identify which fruit are good to eat, which are ripe, which are not yet ripe, that can proffer a real survival advantage. And so it is something that can be easily selected for by a natural selection. But yeah, color vision is a big, you know, <laughs> it's an important thing to have if you're going to be eating fruit. In 2006, while a graduate yeah. student at Yale, paleontologist Jacob Vinther was studying a fossil squid with preserved ink sacs. Those are the little organs where squids store the defensive inks. And when mm -hmm. Vinther studied them under a microscope, he saw that the sacs were filled with tiny spheres. Other paleontologists mm. had seen these little blobs before, but they thought they were just fossilized bacteria. But to Vinther's eye, they looked like special structures that help give animals color, melanosomes. If you've yeah. heard of these before, it's probably because you have them. Lots of animals do. Melanosomes are responsible for all of your body's coloration, from your skin to your eyes to your hair. Each melanosome yep. contains some type of melanin, which is a natural pigment. And based on their density and distribution, they can create different colors. Now I know what you're wondering. What in the name of Charles R. Knight does a Jurassic squid have to do with dinosaurs? Well, you know what else has melanosomes? Feathers. Experts yep. can look at the feather of a living too. bird, like a cardinal or a crow, and see what kind of melanosomes make that feather's color. For example, long, skinny mm -hmm. melanosomes. So they actually have different structures, different gray, shapes. Like the black you find around a cardinal's eyes. But if melanosomes mm -hmm. are short and round, they make reddish colors, like what you would see on red tail hawks. This information can be used as a template for studying ancient animals. So living dinosaurs are basically the color key to extinct dinosaurs. In 2010, yep. this idea was put to the test in a place that's famous for its abundant fossils of feathered dinosaurs. Yeah, the Yixian Formation there, in Liaoning. Chinese and British scientists studied what might be one of the most adorable dinosaurs ever, the chicken-sized Cynosauropteryx. Oh yeah. Cynosauropteryx was the first non-avian dinosaur to be discovered with structures of feather-like fluff back in 1996. And after studying the melanosomes found in that fuzz, researchers determined that Cynosauropteryx was ginger. Its downy <laughs> coat was apparently reddish brown over most of its body, but its tail was a little different, alternating between light and dark bands, giving it some extra flair. Vinther and his colleagues cool. used this same technique to reconstruct the plumage of another feathery pigeon-sized dinosaur called Anchiornis. And it turns out that this dinosaur looked kind of like punk rock magpie, mostly black and white on its wings like and legs with a splash of yeah. red on its top. After this, the colors of more dinosaurs were soon revealed. The four-winged microraptor, it had dark iridescent plumage. And what's really funny is uh, a <laughs> generic spin-off says hundreds of millions of years ago uh, was basically Avatar. I mean, this looks like something out of Avatar, right? But this is microraptor. This is a relative of velociraptor. This is real. It's small, as the name would apply, Microraptor. But yeah, we think it was a, a gliding dinosaur. Um, some of the stuff from Avatar was taken like more or less directly from fossil history here on Earth. Like there are a number of different creatures that are, you know, clearly inspired by. I don't know this officially, but like I look at some of these and I go, that's clearly inspired by this or that, you know, fossil creature. Yeah. Image, kind of like a raven, and one specimen of the little horned dinosaur Cytacosaurus was even yeah. isolated. Says we can only really tell the colors of feathered dinosaurs. No, some other dinosaurs that have preserved skin, like Cytacosaurus, right here. We can look at the melanosomes in the fossil skin as well. So it's not just feathers. 
to have yeah. melanosomes in its skin, revealing yeah. that the dino was dark on top and light underneath. Pretty cool, Countershaded, right? like we were talking about. As the dinosaur is preserved with feathers or some other structure that keeps melanosomes intact, scientists like can figure out their basic colors. Now this is all awesome and exciting, but these discoveries are about a lot more than just what dinosaurs looked like. They can also tell us about how they lived. For sure. example, in birds, we know that feathers aren't just used for flight. They're also an important part of display behavior. So Cynosauropteryx probably didn't have a banded tail just by chance. Its flashy pattern tells us that this dinosaur may have had something to say to other members of its species, like that he wanted to claim his territory or show off how fit he was for the ladies. And the pattern found on Cytacosaurus, <laughs> dark on top and light below, is a common phenomenon seen in lots of modern animals. It's called countershading, and it would have helped this little herbivore blend in while walking through the sun-dappled forest. Thanks to these developments, experts are beginning yep. to uncover the colors of many other feathered dinosaurs, and new types are being found all the time. So yep. now we can start answering... There's Kai Hong as a good example. I showed this, was it on Thursday? But yeah. A dinosaur that seems to have had highly iridescent feathers around its head. It may have been kind of rainbowy in life. Pretty cool to think about, you know? Yeah. What a neat critter. Hi, Hong. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Walking through the sun-dappled forest. Thanks to these developments, experts are beginning to uncover the colors of many other <laughs> I mean, dinosaurs. Great combo there. That's great. All the time. So now we can start answering that question that's uh. been bugging us for so long. <laughs> and memo to Hollywood, if you're planning on having a Cynosauropteryx in Jurassic World 2, which you should be because they're cute, now you know what color it was. Yeah, and actually that having been said... Um... In one of the Jurassic World games, one of their video games, uh, they actually have Cynosauropteryx. Justin Slaughter, welcome back to today's coverage. Uh, in the I don't want Somewhere narration. There. Goodness. Just give me the dinosaur, please. Uh... No, I don't want that either. Um... I just want to see them running around doing their thing. Let's see. Ooh, there they are eating a goat, I guess. I just want to see them running around. There we go. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> now, the thing that you got to understand about these guys, though, is that we're not 100% sure that this is Cynosauropteryx. That's a confusing way to put it. Let me explain. This animal might not be mature, so we might be looking at more or less a baby dinosaur here. And then going, oh, well, you know, cool, it's got these stripes on its tail and everything, and how cute is it? It very well might just be a baby, and the adult might look completely different from this. There's a really interesting paper that came out this spring by Andrea Cow, talking about how this whole group of dinosaurs, the Compsognathids, might not actually be a valid group. They might just be juveniles of a number of other different dinosaur groups. There we go. Compsognathid day. Family cellular saurian theropods. Small carnivores. Generally conservative in form. Merm, merm, merm. Uh, some authors have proposed that Compsognathid day is not a monophyletic group, so it's not really like a true family. Um, they might not all be related to each other, members of this group. And at least some Compsognathids represent juvenile specimens of larger tetanoran theropods, such as carnosaurs and tyrannosaurs. So it could very well be uh, that uh, this is not really a real group, you know? 
Here. And here's a paper talking about this that I'd highly recommend you take a look at. If, uh... If you're curious about this concept. Um... I find it really compelling, this idea. There's paper right there. Yeah, really interesting paper. I'm actually really excited to talk with this author uh, at the end of October at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting that he'll be presenting research at in Minneapolis. Um, hopefully he'll be there. We'll see. But it's, uh, it's interesting stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and do we only have one? We've got multiple specimens of Sinusoropteryx. Uh, and they vary in size a little bit. So the most famous one, of course, is this guy. Right here. That's the one that we just saw in those videos. And you can even see the striping on the tail just here in the photo. It's, it's really cool how that works. Uh, but there are multiple specimens of this critter. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing there's probably... If it's like a lot of this other stuff from Liaoning, there's probably dozens of specimens. Yeah. Um, and it'd be really interesting to actually do some histo on them. Even if it's like micro-CT... Histology. Looking at the growth rings and the bones. Are these animals mature? I suspect they're not. But there's a way to testing that, you know? Science is not about hunches and about, you know, making uh, unsupported claims. It's about testing ideas, you know? That's what makes it science. You can make a really convincing kind of argument, but science is not about rhetoric. It's about testing ideas, doing experiments to actually figure out what's what. Not just what sounds good, but what can you demonstrate via testing. And so I'm really excited to see this idea tested further, that compsignathids are just juveniles of other groups of larger predatory dinosaurs. I think it's a really neat idea, and I'm excited to see it tested. Yeah. And Little Pink Pony says, are the bones too small for histology? I'm not sure. For a lot of these, they're they're on slabs, and so they might even be kind of squashed flat in some cases. But with some of these advances in CT scanning, you know, computerized tomography scanning, you might be able to just make an ultra high resolution, like, internal scan of this thing, and then be able to count the growth rings that way. I've heard people say that. I I don't know. Part of it almost sounds too good to be true, but, like, I would love for that to be the case, you know, for us to be able to, to do scans like that without actually having to saw this beautiful fossil open. Yeah. Little Pink Pony says, Why is histology done on so few dinosaurs? Well, shoot, a lot of, uh... Well, I, I can play you a clip, actually, that helps explain this. Um, Did you... People went astray again. I mean, if they'd have just taken that, taken Peter Dodson's work and gone on with that, then we would have a lot less dinosaurs than we have. But a lot of dinosaurs are way over split, I like think. To name things. Yeah. And so they went on naming the dinosaurs because they were different. Now, we have a way of actually testing to see whether a dinosaur or any animal is a young one or an older one. And that's by actually cutting into their bones. Yep, by doing histology. Cutting into the bones of a dinosaur, 
is uh, hard to do, as you can imagine, because museums, bones, are precious, right? You go into a museum and they take really good care of them. They put them in foam little containers and, I mean, it's, they're very well taken care of. They don't like it if you come in and want to saw them open and look inside. <laughs> so yep. they don't normally let you do that. But I have a museum, and I collect dinosaurs, and I can saw mine open. <laughs> so that's what I do. Yep. But that is seriously an issue that a lot of, a lot of museum curators and collections managers and people like that are... Uh, they're sometimes really reticent to let you saw a dinosaur open. Yeah. Sequel Sagaba says, hey, can I just cut open that super unique billion-year-old object you spent a year's funding to obtain? It's not quite that extreme, but, you know. Yeah. So, if you cut open a little dinosaur, it's very spongy inside, like A. And there if you, you cut into an older dinosaur, it's very massive. It's very, I mean, you can, you can tell it's mature bone. Anyway, that's how that works. Um, yeah, and Jack had another line in here. It's like, sometimes when you go to a museum and you ask, hey, can I cut open your dinosaur skull? They just look at you and they go, go away. <laughs> but the thing is, that's why we're collecting fossils in the first place. They're not art objects. They're not supposed to be display pieces. We're using those to learn about the history of life on Earth, to collect data, to do science. And sometimes, you know, to make a science omelet, you gotta crack a few science eggs. And like Jack says, glue is cheap, you know? Find you another clip with Jack talking about this. Um, there we go. Glue is cheap. Now I can see that my oh. uh, Reese. Well spent. Holy cow, thank you for the five months at tier three. No, you chose a good time. Thank you, thank you for that, Reese. I appreciate you more than you know. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Um, Dinosaur bones, which yeah. means literally breaking the bones apart and sometimes dissolving pieces of them in acid. Most paleontologists won't let her near their precious finds. <laughs> Yep. There you go. Yeah, that's why that's one of our sound commands on this channel is you can't have this attitude that like, oh, well, these things are incredibly precious and we can't do any science on them as a result of that. Like, no, it was cheap. And you need to be able to get good data. However, if there are new technologies that emerge that allow us to actually look inside without physically cutting these specimens open, then that's wonderful. And that that might be happening. You know, that might be something that's coming to pass. It's going to be really expensive, and we're not going to have access to that technology oftentimes, even if it does exist. But micro CT, if we could do a histo with that, then that's that's going to be pretty cool. That's going to be pretty darn cool.
cool. Yeah. Rakedactylus says you shouldn't get sentimental with your data. You should analyze it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and Drew Ellen says my wife's friend works on fossil teeth and she cut them open to see the formation, structure, and degradation. Exactly. Yeah. That information is a valuable data point. Figure out the diet and habitat. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know. Sometimes I get the sense that the people at some of these institutions who are really reticent to let you cut things open they have such a precious attitude about these specimens because their institutions are often kind of on the dead side of things like they're not active lively living collections where they're actually going out and collecting new specimens and stuff if it's just a static dead space where you've got all these things that well, we have these things and you know there they are it's not like they're going out and sending field crews to, to collect new fossils all the time and sample new areas and try and fill in gaps in the collection or anything. If they're not doing that, then they might be much more likely to have that attitude of, you know, these things are so precious that you can't touch them, you know? Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Wanting to specialize in early Triassic dinosaurs. Very cool, Hugan. Oh, shoot. And Hugan, I think I missed your question earlier. Trying to tell the difference between dinosaurs and other very dinosaur-like ornithodiron archosaurs in the late Triassic. And it's tricky. Like, that's something that stumps a lot of paleontologists right now. We're still not sure whether things like Silosaurs are just... Very dinosaur like, non dinosaur dinosauriforms? Or are they true dinosaurs? We're still trying to figure out a lot of, uh, out of a lot of that stuff, so it's there's definitely a lot of work to be done there, Hugan. Yeah. Yeah. Um oh wait, Aedosaurs we definitely know are not dinosaurs. But yeah. Um Yeah. But there are other much more dinosaur-like animals that may or may not be dinosaurs. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, Silosaurs. Is this critter a dinosaur or is it not? You know, we're still figuring a lot of this stuff out. Still mysterious. So, yeah. Yeah. Um... There you go, Mayor Space. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, speaking of sweeping the floors, uh, I need to wrap this up because I've got to get ready for some exciting stuff tomorrow. I may or may not be able to stream tomorrow depending on how some stuff goes. But I've got an exciting project that I'm a part of in the morning, tomorrow and Wednesday morning. And that might go into the afternoon, and I might not stream tomorrow. The next time I stream might even be Friday. Just so you know. But I want you to know that this, something very excited that I'm... Oh man, I can't wait to make an announcement about this, but I'm holding off for right now until some of the other members of my team are... Uh... Until we all agree that go ahead with making this announcement. We've got some exciting fossil stuff going on here in the Bay Area. And, uh, yeah. All I'll say is, wish me luck tomorrow that we find some good stuff. Uh, let's hope the fossils are forthcoming. Anyway, with that being said, let's, uh, begin our wrap-up procedure here. Uh, and the secret project, yes, Zook. The mods already know about this. But I'm really excited to tell everybody else. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah! So, probably won't stream tomorrow. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh... Uh, out us, why don't you? Sorry, Ken. <laughs> uh, stay strong, mods. Don't spill the beans. Yeah. Uh, 
then Rakedactylus. Have you been in the Discord or not? <laughs> Anywho, thank you to everybody who's showing up in our credits right now, from new followers to resubscribers to gifters and cheerers, moderators, keeping this train on its tracks. I appreciate you. Um, but yeah, you're just goofing around. Okay, Rico. Good. I'm glad we're not genuinely confused. I guess just me. Joke. I'm confused. But yeah. Holy cow. Um, excited for tomorrow. Excited about our new Diplodocus Skull 2. Thanks for your patience while I assembled this today. Excited to work on this a little bit. And, uh, I gotta go pack a bag, too. Everybody, thank you, thank you for a wonderful stream. I hope you had a good time. Let's find somebody to raid here. Who else have we got? Uh, live on Twitch right now. Um, let's go say hello to Cyant Streams. Uh, Balint is a professional molecular and systems biologist who also streams here on Twitch. That is a gigantic ant that he... Oh, it's under a microscope. Okay. Let's say that ant is bigger than he is. I mean... Holy cow, look at that ant. Anyway, we're going to go read into Berlin. And I hope to see you there, everybody. You all take care of yourselves, and uh, I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.